Hello there, it's me, Lucky Black Cat. I know it's been a while since we've seen each other, but don't worry, I am working very hard on more videos for you, and I'm actually making several videos which will be released in short intervals, and I'll give you details about that at the end of this video. So in the meantime, I have something very special for you. I've bravely conquered my anxiety about live streaming somehow. I don't know how I did this. And now I've been a guest on The Action Show, which is a live stream show on the channel Non-Compete. And I've taken that video of my guest appearance and put it right here in this video for you to watch. So I hope you do watch because we discuss some really important stuff. Uh, we're discussing some research-based advice that is useful if you want to organize some class struggle in any sort of situation, uh, whether it's in your workplace or a tenant union in your neighborhood or build a mutual aid network or grow and expand a movement, whatever sort of organizing or activism goal you might have, we have advice for you. And it's advice that draws on two sources. One, research from social psychology, and two, real life examples of activism and class struggle. And also, as a bonus, you get to see what I'm like live, which, okay, that part is actually kind of terrifying to me, and I hate that part, but <sighs> anyways, so if you want to see me in action on The Action Show, stick around. It is coming right up in this video, and if you want to know more about the videos that I'm working on right now uh, for this channel, then stick around until the end of the video and I will tell you. Or, you know, you could always just skip right to the end. I've put little chapters, timestamps down, and if you look at the little red bar, you can fucking just go click on the thing at the for the outro and you can just skip to that and find out what I have going on for this channel in the future. But I hope you don't skip and actually watch the stream. I think that we talk about some really useful stuff. All right, well, here it is. It's action show time. I'm going to go ahead and welcome our guest, Lucky Black Cat. Hello. Hello. Lucky Black Cat. Hello, hello. It's been a long time coming, Lucky Black Cat. Been, uh, yes. been a fan of yours for, I think, a couple oh. of years now since you started your YouTube what? channel, right? Wow. How long has it been? Yes. Oh, I, I, was, I wasn't expressing shock at the two years thing. I was expressing shock that you're a fan of mine. I don't even know if I'm a fan of mine. <laughs> well... <laughs> I, I definitely appreciate what you're doing, um, and I'm glad we finally... I mean, I, I think we've talked about streaming together for like a long, long time, but this is the yes. first time we've actually yeah, had the opportunity. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, better late than never. I'm really glad you're here. Um, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and your channel and uh, what you're all about before we get into the presentation? Yeah, um, I'm Lucky Black Cat, and that's all one word. I have a YouTube channel, and I like to do videos on all kinds of things. Um, capitalism, socialism, communism, anarchism, social justice issues, um, everything. Uh, all the stuff I haven't we necessarily love. gotten to everything yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, yeah. you know, it's like it's like the uh, the dialectic never ends, and we are anarchists not because... It's the end goal, but because there is no end goal. So you should be able to keep talking for a long, long time. Um, and yeah, what, so what are we talking about today specifically? Um, I know that you're going to be talking about the uh, social psychology of activism. Well, it's not um, just social psychology for its own sake. The, the point of it is to give advice, general advice for really any activist organizer um, that drawing insights from from that and also real life activist struggles so like right. whether your goal is to organize your workplace your neighborhood or build a mass movement whatever it is this advice can be helpful for any of that um and it will draw insights from two sources as you said social psychology but also not just like the academic wankery of social psychology which okay i'm being a little um a facing of it right now which maybe i shouldn't but also real life activist struggles like real shit these things are going to coalesce and we'll see how they uh, can actually create synergy or overlap or whatever you want to call it. Um, right. So, and and through through the insights from these two things, we can provide insights to how to build a movement more effectively and organize more awesome. effectively. Awesome. Uh, so, answer. yeah. So, social psychology. Uh, what is it? It's basically just the study of people's psychological reactions to social situations. So, like 
It's trying to figure out how do people behave, their, their behavior, their attitudes, their beliefs, their goals, their actions, and so on. How are these influenced by other people? Uh, to some degree, it's like a bridge between sociology and psychology, but not really. Uh, you might already be familiar with some of these, uh, for, with some stuff from social psychology. The Milgram experiments is a very famous social psychology experiment. The Stanford prison experiments also as well. I know uh, that one. What was yeah, the but, what was the Milgram? Is that when they had the the people in like lab coats that were inflicting pain on people, or is that a different one? Absolutely, they weren't really inflicting okay. pain on people, but they were pretending to, and they were seeing if people would obey the person right. in the lab coat uh, because the experiment must continue, said the guy in the lab coat, uh, even though you're inflicting pain right. on someone for the experiment to continue. But we won't get into that; it's it's not really important <laughs> for what we're talking about today. Yeah. Um, right. Anyway, so there have been experiments in social psychology which give insights that activists and organizers can use to increase people's active participation in a movement. And uh, this has been validated by successful activist struggles and movements that have used these strategies. And quite likely they have been using these strategies without even realizing that these strategies are supported by social psychology research. So I'd like to discuss this research and also some of the struggles that validate its findings. Uh, specifically, yeah we'll be looking at the Quebec student strike, uh, a struggle by unionized hotel workers in San Francisco, and a struggle against a landlord by the Seattle Solidarity Network. Wow, those okay. are that, those are gonna be some <laughs> exciting examples. We did oh. just have uh, Nora pop on, so Nora's here with us now. Oh, hello, Nora. <laughs> Hi. Glad you're here. Very, very glad to have you. Yeah, um, I, I had no idea what time we agreed on, so. <laughs> we, we only just started like a few minutes ago, so. Yeah, yeah. you're like um, the you're like the the exciting new character in our action-packed adventure. <laughs> and you'll be, you'll be with us as we journey through the social psychology of, of, uh, of activism. Um, but yeah, Nora's, Nora's our co-host. If you didn't know, everyone subscribe to Nora uh, and Lucky Black Cat. Um, I put the links in the description of YouTube. I'll drop them in the chat as well. Um, but yeah, Nora, we're, we're just getting started with the presentation. So you just came in time to learn with us. Um, awesome. So let's, uh, I guess, it. let's uh, sit back and relax and learn yeah. about uh, the social psychology of what? activism. How, how are you, Nora? Are, 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 you, oh. are you good today, Nora? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Um, I was just um, thinking about um, Amazon unions. Because okay. Honestly, mm. uh, yeah. A lot of, a lot of social psychology <laughs> happening there. I'm sure. Yeah. In the well, Amazon world. Well, hopefully, if hopefully there'll be some Amazon workers listening to this, and if not, maybe someone knows an Amazon worker, or it doesn't have to be Amazon anywhere. <laughs> All workers need to organize everywhere. So workers um, of the world. Yes, workers of the world, or you know, in your neighborhood as tenants, or wherever you're trying to struggle. So, like the the point of this, uh, I'll I'll just very quickly uh, reiterate. So, since you're here now, Nora, is to take insights from social psychology and real life activist struggles and draw from those to provide uh, lessons that we can use as activists, as organizers, to build our movements and our struggles. So, um, in in organizing and movement building, one common problem that people often face is that there's not enough participation. Uh, either there's small membership, or maybe you have a decent size, mem size membership, but those members are not participating. They're just paper members, but they're not really active. So what do we do about that? And uh, thankfully, social psychology has some insights we can use. So, uh, oh, sorry, just really quickly, by the way, Nora, and also again, EJ, um, just jump in any time you want to interrupt with, a, with if you have a comment to add. Or, or a question or, or anything like that. Just feel free to interrupt. Yeah. It's fine. Okay. That goes to you too, chat. If, if, if you and, have any questions, yes. sound off and I'll, I'll relay them to uh, Lucky Black Cat. So. Okay. I just want to see Amazon Union in the chat all day long. Please, please. If anyone knows any Amazon workers, call them and tell them to tune in right fucking now. It is time. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we'll School start is with... in. Yes, it's school time. <laughs> well, uh, anyways, um, so uh, we'll start with the research experiment from the 1960s by psychologists Jonathan L. Friedman and Scott C. Fraser. Uh, this took place in a California suburb called Palo Alto. And the researchers went door to door in a neighborhood asking uh, people at the door, hey, can we put 
a sign in your art in your yard that says drive carefully now this sign was huge it was an eyesore like it was just like drive carefully uh, so most people unsurprisingly said no only 17 percent said yes okay so then the researchers went to another neighborhood and this time they went door to door but they asked can we put this small sign in your window that says be a safe driver so people were like yeah you know it's just a little sign in the window sure most people said yes now, a couple of weeks later, they went back to that same neighborhood where they were asking about the small sign. And they asked, can we put this huge, big ass drive carefully sign in your front lawn? This time, 76% said yes. And again, in the other neighborhood, it was only 17%. So that's about 4.5 times more people saying yes. So why the difference? The theory is that people like to stay consistent uh, with their past statements, with their beliefs, with their commitments. So when you agree to put a small sign in your window, you've basically made a small commitment to promoting safe driving. And you start to think of yourself as an advocate for safe driving. And now the large sign just becomes this logical next step to stay consistent in your values and your identity. And people like that because when you're consistent, it feels like you're being true to yourself. And if you're not being consistent or if you're being inconsistent, now that feels like you're just going against yourself. You're contradicting yourself. You're betraying your own values. And people don't like to do that. So the lesson from that is if you can convince someone to make even just a small commitment, they're more likely to continue in that direction. Now, this is often called the foot in the door technique because you can get a small yes that gets your foot in the door. And now you can move on to hopefully get a bigger yes. So now, you can use, yep. So I'm just gonna come in with the only reference I know. Um, basically it's like all those like weird anime games where they're like, oh, join the club. It, it'll be like, it'll be fine in the main characters hates like all the clubs, but then he joins anyway. And then it's uh -huh. like a, the small foot in the door thing, and then he stays in the club, kind of like Doki Doki Literature Club. I wish I watched more anime so I could get that reference, but I think I, I think I get what you're saying. So they sort of they get them they get them to just join the club, and from then they can like draw them in further to more of their maybe weird acti the activities they're doing there. Yes. Kind okay. Of like that. Cool. Okay. Um, so this is useful both in anime and also in organizing or hopefully there would be <laughs> <laughs> or hopefully there would be maybe an anime about organizing which there should be more animes about organizing be. that's um, that this this is a message for you all you anime <laughs> animators yeah because i'm sure there's a word for that i don't um yes um so Again, there's there's this common problem in, in organizing activism and so on, that there's just not enough participation. The membership base is small. We need to draw in more people or the members are not actively participating. So a way to deal with that is try to get a small yes from people. Just ask something small, like sign a petition. And from there, you can then more easily maybe get a bigger yes, like will you attend a meeting? Will you hand out leaflets? And then from there, you can maybe get them to agree to do something uh, even more, participate even further. So the strategy is basically drawing people in, in small increments. You get a small commitment, small level of participation, and you nudge them forward gradually. Um, this is so much like the marketing, the marketing funnel. I was a marketer yes. for like a decade. It's always just like first, like click the link and then subscribe to the email newsletter. And then eventually it's like, spend the money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually like, I, I know like as anarchists, communists, socialists, we're probably like cringing at the idea of marketing, but there are insights from there that can be used for anti-market purposes, for like purposes of fighting the market. And I think we should not cringe at them. We should, you know, learn lessons from our enemies, not some of the lessons from them we don't want to learn, but some of them might be <laughs> useful and we can apply them in, in good ways. So uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, they, they spend millions and millions of dollars on like research on psychological research and stuff like that. So it's yeah. like, we don't have those resources. So we have to kind of crib and adapt. Well, we, we can, can to 
Yeah, exactly. Well, we can learn from their research that they, they've done for us. <laughs> we can figure it out. And exactly. whole, it won't always apply. Sometimes it'll be like, who wants to drink Coca-Cola? We don't give a shit about that. <laughs> but like, right. <laughs> this kind of stuff is cool. Um, okay, so this foot in the door method can be used for both outreach and inreach. So outreach would be uh, reaching out to people who are not in your organization, just like anyone you want to like, like if, if you have a workplace committee and you're trying to draw in coworkers who are not yet in the committee, you can use it for that. Or if you're, you know, organizing a tenants union, uh, you, you can, you know, use it for people who are not, a, not yet in the tenants union and so on. But it can also be used for inreach, which is people within your own organization, people who might be signed up officially as members, but they're actually just paper members. They're not really participating. And you can still use this foot in the door technique to sort of try to draw them back in and make them more active. Um, so the foot in the door technique, it helps increase people's participation, but it can also help with increasing people's comfort level with bold tactics, going from more, more tame tactics to more bold, risky, mil militant, radical tactics. So you might start people with signing a petition. Maybe if they're willing to sign a petition, now they might next be willing to mar do a march on the boss. Um, and if they're willing to do that, now they might feel comfortable with doing an hour long sit down strike. And if they're willing to do an hour long sit down strike, maybe next they'll be willing to do an unlimited sit down strike. Next thing you know, they feel okay with occupying the whole factory and then we have a revolution. So <laughs> obviously, <laughs> yes. Uh, obviously easier said than done. Um, so, you know, each of those steps can take a lot of work to get people from A to B to C to D, but having things laid out like that and moving people along gradually like that can make people more comfortable with the next step. Um, so I don't want to yeah. make it sound easy, but this will, it's, it's always going to be a struggle. It's always going to be hard, but this will make it easier. Yeah. This is this is great um, because I'm just thinking about an organization I'm in. Yeah. And um, it's a group of all sorts of different people, um, but we feel like we've been like losing touch with a certain group of people, like the okay. labor people. Right. Oh, like over the course of COVID, like okay. they became, be they have become like less and less active because. They typically like to meet in person and we're not doing a whole lot of meetings in person anymore. Yeah. So they're not like even participating in the org at all almost. Yeah. And we've been trying to like figure out ways to like draw them back in. And that's, this is great because um, it's going to give me all sorts of ideas. Oh, that's great. I'm so glad to hear that. Another thing, this wasn't in the presentation, so I'm going a bit off script here, but it can help to have like, depending on how many, how much capacity you have, like to either have like someone whose job, like within, not job, sorry, their role within the organization is in reach. You can have one person who's, whose role is in reach or you can have a whole committee, an in reach committee. And their whole focus is to reach out to other members in the organization and like, you know, call them, text them, you know, try to try to keep that connection going um, and, and, and so on like this. I hate to bring up the marketing thing again, but yeah. one thing that I know is from advertising is you always try to go after the people who've already made a purchase you right. know, when you're doing marketing because the resistance to buy again is way lower. And it, it's like, I, I don't remember the exact number, but um, you spend like $1 to get a repeat customer back versus like $10 for a new customer. And it yeah. also links in with the question CJ1295 just asked, asked which is... Um, is the foot in the door similar to the far right pipeline? I think it is. And I think that, um, I mean, I, you know, based on my video on the, on the PD pipeline with the uh, pyramid of violence and the stochastic violence, uh, stochastic terrorism uh, pipeline, um, I do think it's kind of the same principles at work where it's like you're yeah. starting out at a very small level and you're getting people uh, brought in more and more. Um, I think this is just kind of the way I mean, this is just kind of a, a universe. Is, is it? Is that true? Is that does that is that ring, ring true to you, Lucky Black Hat? Basically, that, like, yeah. It's almost that, like a universal principle. Yeah, I mean, there are some people who will make huge leaps in either their actions or their beliefs or or what they're comfortable with, but most people will be drawn incrementally into something, whether that's right. for better or for worse. So, 
our goal is to try to use that for good. Um, yeah. Now we, we, of course, we don't want to be manipulative. We don't want to be, to me, manipulative means that you're being dishonest and right, right. that you're um, tr doing something that's f for, you're using someone for your own purposes. Now that's not what this is about. You want to be honest. You want to be transparent. And, you know, obviously the people that we're working with are, it's, it's not about like something for ourselves. It's about our collective liberation. It's about them too. And you, so, so I, I wouldn't consider this, you know, so, so, so yeah, you, you don't want to be manipulative. You want to be yeah. honest. It's um, just the same as propaganda, you know, like we're, we, I, I, this is the last thing I'll say, and then I'll shut up and you can continue the presentation, but propaganda can also be like used for good and it can be honest or it can be like yeah. propaganda is just persuasive communication exactly and you yeah. can be honest or you can be dishonest and manipulative it's the same it's the same principle i Absol think it sounds very absolutely similar. yeah i know the, the word propaganda has been turned into something dirty uh and you know we, we probably shouldn't use it because people will misunderstand but propaganda yeah it just means any sort of material that's attempting to persuade someone so um and there's the it's not necessarily dishonest and we should never be just we don't have to be dishonest in order to win like our enemies do because they're trying the to truth on our side. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we should always be honest. Um, yeah, honest propaganda. <laughs> uh, okay, so now that we've looked at this social psychology experiment, um, we want to see that is it validated by actual real life, um, you know, shit, you know, is it just some wankery academic bullshit? Or is it actually real shit? Well, I guess it's not, you know, you know what I'm saying? Does it, does it actually work for activism and organizing? And the answer is that it very much seems that it does. So the example we'll focus on um, for the foot in the door technique is the Quebec student strike of 2012. Um, now I know there's uh, a lot of people listening to this. So not everyone, I mean, you, you guys probably, everyone here knows um, so that Quebec, is, but I don't know. I, I, I hope, I just don't want to seem like, I was like, should I put this in my notes or not? Quebec is a province in Canada. I was like, will this seem condescending? Uh, a lot of probably. Americans know absolutely nothing about Canada. <laughs> yeah. And I only have really learned stuff about Canada and, since becoming people, a leftist. <laughs> so there's people from all, all over the world. And, and, and yeah, so, so I, I, anyways, I, I'm, I'm doing yeah, too much yeah. of my I internal think it's monologue fair. here. So I'll, I'll <laughs> cut up internal monologue. Um, so Quebec is a province in Canada. It has a population of over 8 million. Um, and Quebec has the lowest tuition fees of any province in Canada. And that's thanks in part to a history of student strikes. Uh, in early 2010, the Quebec government announced a plan to raise tuition fees by 75% over five years, starting in 2012. So that's a huge increase, 75%. Uh, obviously, students were very unhappy about this. Uh, so they decided we need to do something. Um, so there's three major student associations in Quebec. There's the FEUQ, the, FE, the FECQ, and C-L-A-S-S-E, -S -S -E, which is Class A. Um, so Class A was the most and is the most radical of all of them. They're the most radical in their goals. Their goal is for free post-secondary education. And they're also radical in their structures. They're into direct democracy decision-making in weekly student assemblies, rather than just having elected uh, delegated executive power. You know, so they, they want that sort of grassroots power from below anarchist style of organizing and decision making. Uh, and also class A represented half of the striking students. So not only were they the most radical, but they were the biggest, which is great. Um, and how did they do that? Well, um, student organizers in class A used the foot in the door method to gradually es escalate people's participation and the tactics that were used in this struggle. So from the start, the organizers said, if we want to stop this tuition increase, we need to have an unlimited general student strike, period. Okay, so by unlimited, that means for as long as it took to make the government cave in, and general meaning at every single university and college across uh, the province. So they said this repeatedly to students from the start, but they knew that the strike wouldn't have enough support or mobilization behind it 
uh, at least not yet. So they didn't try to leap into it. That would have been a failed mission. Uh, they started by asking students to sign petitions. Now, normally, obviously, like, you know, change.org, all that shit is probably not going to do very much uh, at all, if anything, right? Uh, but as part of a movement building strategy, petitions can actually be really effective. So they got 30,000 signatures on this petition. Uh, from there, they escalated to having protests, a whole bunch of protests. They also escalated from there to occupying university buildings and more protests. And they even had a one day strike. Uh, the goal from all this act action, they didn't think it was going to win their demands. Their goal was basically to build a movement, to draw in as many students as possible to be active and participating. And it worked. Gradually, through all of this, they drew more and more students into the movement. Um, and as all of this was going on, there was also ongoing student assemblies at each school. And in these assemblies, there was discussion and decision making, you know, direct democracy, that very like anarchist bottom up style of including everyone, having everyone participate, having everyone shape the direction of the movement. Now, that doesn't mean that there's no like leaders in the sense of people who are taking a more active role and trying to push things in the more, um, you know, radical direction because there very much was. But, you know, they weren't controlling things from the top down. They weren't these executives that were trying to shape things in the sense of, um, you know, pushing it without consent, they were trying to persuade, make everyone understand that this is what needs to happen. Uh, and they would, you know, bring that up in, in these meetings uh, and also, you know, on, on the picket line or, or sorry, on, on, in, in the protest and whatever. So uh, like, you know, through speeches of the protest, et cetera. Um, so as each of these actions failed along the way and, and get, didn't get the results they wanted, eventually, the students started to realize that those who had been calling for the unlimited general student strike had been right this whole time. You know, nothing else is working. We need to go all in. We need to go all the way. So they held a strike vote and the majority voted yes. So the strike began in February 2012. That was two years after the movement began. So they had been working at this a long time. Um, and at the peak of the strike, there was 175,000 students involved who were in, in the strike. That is over half of Quebec's 342,000 post-secondary students. And in their demonstrations were also huge. They had up to 200,000 students as well as supporters involved. Um, through, through all this, there, there was a lot of, uh, you know, confrontations with the cops and with the state. There were 3,000 arrests over the course of this movement. Um, and the Quebec, the Quebec government, in an effort to stop this, passed something called Law 12 uh, that criminalized protests within 50 meters of a school. Um, it also yeah. criminalized... <laughs> Are you laughing at meters? <laughs> I'm not uh, just uh, criminalizing the protest. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> no. I thought it was like, I thought it was like. Uh, no, no, no. I was just laughing because I was just thinking about how like all the, you know, the state's last ditch efforts always to make it not a law that at that point it's already too late. Right. Free speech zones. T sorry to make it, I didn't actually hear what you said. My, my. My oh, might um, be I was just saying that um, I was just thinking about how that was their last just effort when it was already way too late. Oh, and, yeah. And <laughs> we've had some more things like that in the United States and it never pans out. Yeah, they, it's, a, it's a clear sign of desperation, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, they 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 passed this very desperate law, and yeah, it didn't it didn't work out for them. So they they uh, criminalized protests within 50 meters of schools. They also criminalized protests anywhere that didn't tell police the planned route in in advance. Um, and now the fines for violating this law were actually very intense. So you could be fined uh, just as an individual, you'd be fined up to five thousand dollars for violating this law. Uh, if you were a student leader, though, you could be fined up to $35,000. And uh, if for your organization violating this law, $125,000 fine. So th these are like big, yeah, yeah, exactly. Scary, scary, big penalties. Um, but people did not give a fuck. So May 22nd, very shortly after the law was passed, 
hundreds of thousands of people marched in Montreal to protest the law. And this is considered the largest act of civil disobedience in Canadian history, only because this protest itself was, was illegal. You know, they didn't follow the rules of this new law. Um, so, you know, the, the, the best way to, to, to get rid of a law is to fucking break it on like in, in big, big numbers. And that's what happened. So the civil disobedience continued after that big march. Uh, there continued to be spontaneous demonstrations in various neighborhoods. Uh, there'd be several simultaneous marches, uh, each one having hundreds or sometimes even thousands of peoples. And the cops, they can't deal very well with like a bunch of shit going on at the same time. If there's like one centralized march with a whole shit ton of people, it's a lot easier for the cops to deal with that than even if there's smaller numbers, but they're broken up all over the place. It's just a big problem. So the cops just basically are like, ah, fuck, we can't, we can't do this shit. So, and we kind of we're having a connection issue from you. You turned into a oh, robot for a moment there. Me? I did. E, on my end, yeah. I think you sound okay oh, now, though. No. Can you just uh, you sound, start you that sound, thought? You, you sound good now. Just uh, walk, yeah. walk it back okay. a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. Basically, the, these these protests happening all over the place. It's fairly hard for the cops to keep control of them if they're happening in a bunch of different places at once. Uh, it's just a big logistics problem. It's easier to just deal with one centralized protest. Um, so, yeah, so there were, at, at its, this continued for two weeks, all these like decentralized protests in different neighborhoods all going on at the same time. Um, at its peak, there were tens of thousands of, of people involved in like separate marches all over the city, basically dozens of protests happening at the same time. Um, so once a movement is this big, it basically has like a gravity of its own and it draws people in without needing to use the foot in the door technique. The foot in the door technique is very good for like building that momentum. But as when you, when you get to the size like this, people just start like getting sucked in. Um, Reminds you a lot of like black lives matter last year. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, perfect example. Um, and, and, Sometimes stuff when stuff like that happens, people can often just assume it's just like a spontaneous uprising. And in many ways it is, but behind the scenes, there was often a lot of organizing to mobilize those right. initial people that got involved. That's um, what a lot of black activists I've talked to have said is that like oh, Black really? Lives Matter seems like it came out of nowhere, but people have been working back like, you know, back into like the nineties and before, you know, like there's this 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 long legacy. And it's like the the abolish the police um movement you know that, that's got long roots going back a long time yes. and they did a lot of work to get to the point where when black lives matter exploded there were like kind of like this apparatus in place to push the agenda yeah. and that sort of thing so yeah even yeah. even even now there's all sorts of planning going on for the black lives matter protests because we know it's going to be an inevitable inevitable that like some sort of thing starts up again so like people are planning now and preparing for that. Good. It's like Gr Gramsci talked about. Um, I, I'll just try to put this out quickly, but like Gramsci mm -hmm. talked about how crisis is inevitable under capitalism, and so we should use crises as like our artillery and just like <laughs> always expect there to be a crisis around the corner and be the the thing we need to do is be ready through organizing to take advantage of that crisis when it happens. So absolutely, makes yeah, organizing can be like considered like uh gathering the tinder right like like stacking up all your fucking twigs and 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 i don't know other pieces of wood and so on and you might be like oh we're not getting results why isn't nothing happening from this oh shit uh but then the spark comes and boom but if you hadn't gathered that tinder that whole time the spark would come fucking nothing so like i think a lot of time we can get discouraged as like organizers and activists because we're laying all this shit down and it doesn't seem like very much momentum is coming from it but like trust me it will matter it's, it's all about per like getting things ready for as as you said uh the right moment for that spark to come and like set shit off so yeah ab absolutely um so anyways, so this uh, Quebec uh, student strike went on for over six months and in the end, they won. So the tuition increase was fucking canceled. Uh, the worst aspects of law 12 were repealed and eventually the law expired. Um, and also there was like just the fact that they had mass resistance and, and mass civil disobedience to and made law 12 just basically unenforceable, I think should also count as a victory. 
Um, now they didn't win for abolishing tuition fees, which as I mentioned was like a goal of class A. So I guess it wasn't, it wasn't a total victory in that sense, but at least they got the tuition increase canceled. So that's good. Um, so if you'd like to learn, anyone watching this wants to learn more about uh, the Quebec student strike, I would recommend um, reading Organize to Strike, Fight to Win, Quebec's 2012 student strike by Class A. So this is written by the organizers who were involved in doing all the shit I just described. It's obviously best to hear it from the people themselves who did this shit. They, they will, you'll get the inside scoop. So again, that is Organize to Strike, Fight to Win, Quebec's 2012 student strike by C-L-A-S-S-E, -S -S -E, and it's online for free. You can find it. Oh, nice. Very cool. I'll try to find that link uh, while yeah. you continue your proposal. Yeah, and... maybe you can drop it in the, I, I hope it's still online. Like I, I downloaded this shit like way back in the day. So <laughs> maybe it's not up there. I'll no do some more. Googling right now. Yeah. Uh-oh, uh, my audio cut out. I can't hear anything anymore. Are, can someone say something? Right. Oh, I think my I mic can, was mu muted maybe. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, okay, so um, the foot in the door technique has a mirror opposite technique called door in the face. Um, and I think this can sort of be summed up by quoting a clever child who once said, if you want a puppy, ask for a pony. So basically, if you want something big, uh, you ask for it, you'll probably get a no the door will be slammed in your face, and then you ask for something small, and you'll be more likely to get, uh, get a yes than if you just started by asking for the small thing. Um, so again, this sounds very opposite from the foot in the door technique, so you might be wondering, well, uh, you know, which one is more effective? And actually there is a meta-analysis of 22 studies comparing the door in the face technique with the foot in the door technique. It was published in the journal Psychological Reports. And it found that both methods work equally well. So take your pick. <laughs> um, now, how do nice. we apply this? Yeah. So how do we apply this to movement building? Um, now, so when asking someone to participate, should we actually just start by asking them to take on some unreasonably huge amount of responsibility? I would, I think we should not do that. I would recommend it against that because if you ask someone to do too much, it could alienate them and, you know, and, and even if they say yes, they might end up failing because they take on more than they can handle. I just, I just don't think you should ever ask something to do some, someone to do something that you think is unreasonable. Uh, yeah. So then, so then the question is like, how do we actually apply this door in the face technique? Like how, how do we use that insight for organizing for activism? So uh, I think that the way to do it is if you ask someone to take on a task, whatever it may be, and they say no, instead of just giving up on that person and be like, oh, well, I guess they want, don't wanna participate, just ask them to do something smaller than the thing that they said no to. And the chances of them saying yes will now be higher. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this, this kind of reminds me of another thing with the organization I'm in. Mm -hmm. we, we have someone who's very young. He's kind of like a puppy Aww. and... <laughs> And we, he, he wants to do like too many things at once. And we're just like, just, just slow down a little. Like, yeah. <laughs> so we were thinking about uh, giving him like really small tasks and like letting him build, build up from there. And <laughs> yeah, you don't want them to burn out or like to, to take on too much and then, and then like fail and then like lose their confidence or, or anything like that. So. Yeah. yeah, it's also really bad when you have somebody who's um, doing too many things at once. I've seen this happen many, many times. I think I've been this person a couple of times too. Like one person's doing too many things, and then like the whole organization's relying on this one person, and then that one person like oh, has yeah. an emergency or gets burnt out or whatever, <laughs> and there's this huge like vacuum now because that person was was just handling too much stuff. So yeah, I think distributing things as much as possible is just generally healthy, more healthy for the organization. Well, yeah, one hundred percent. Your your organization will be more effective, and also, it can also become like a too much power, like to to the people who are taking the most active role. And not not that they necessarily are like power hungry people or anything, but it's just 
uh, you know, it, it's just not a, it's, it, for so many reasons, it's, it's not healthy for it, for that to happen yeah. in an organization. That's a good way. That's a good point. I never thought about it exactly like that, but it's like the hierarchy is not good for the org and it's not good for the person really, if you think about it. Yeah. Um, if, if we are trying to make like an egalitarian sort of flat hierarchy movement. Yeah. Which, which is ideal. <laughs> And also, you know, burnout and everything. We don't, we don't want to torture our comrades yeah. with burnout. We want to respect their boundaries exactly. and stuff. Yeah. We just had a quick question from Spiders Are Wholesome. Um, is there any way to combine door in face and foot in door? The way you talked about the Quebec strike, how they had people calling for a strike from the beginning while simultaneously starting with petitions. Um, That's. Uh, uh, I I just figured. Yeah, I I can answer this. So, basically. Like if you were to talk to some random person on the street and um, say, general, do you want to start a general strike right now? And they say, no. And then you say, how about you join this org that, you know, supports the general strike? And, it's, and then it's like, yes. So you get them to do the small thing while slamming the door in the face. I think that's, that's a very good answer. And I have nothing to add. Hopefully, uh, uh, the person, spider, uh, spider person, or whoever answered the question. <laughs> spider hopefully person is, a, hopefully, is fine with me. That's, Spiders that's, are that's that's satisfied. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Foot in door in face is what spiders are holding yeah. calls that strength. There you go. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, all right. So the next technique uh, we'll talk about, it doesn't have a name. It's basically a variation on the foot in the door technique. Uh, it's basically just asking for a vague, uh, a, a vague commitment before asking for a real commitment. Uh, so the research experiment that we'll look at uh, for this, it was led by S psychology professor Stephen J. Sherman. It was published in Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. Okay, so in this experiment, there were two groups. Group one got a phone call asking, will you volunteer three hours for charity? Only 2% said yes. And then group two got a phone call asking, if a charity asks you to volunteer for three hours, would you do it? Okay, it's hypothetical. 40% said yes. So it's hypothetical. It's very easy to say yes. Uh, you don't actually have to do it. But three days later, those who said yes to this hypothetical thing were uh, got another phone call, but this time they were asked to volunteer three hours for real. And now they're probably thinking, oh, damn it, what did I get myself into? Uh, but, you know, they didn't want to contradict what they had said. So they were more likely to say yes. To say yes. Uh, in fact, 38% said yes. Okay, so I don't want to exaggerate or, make, or, or mislead here. So we're talking about 38% of the 40%, right? Because there was 40% who said yes, hypothetically. So 38% of that 40%. So which, uh, if hopefully I got my math right, was 15%. <laughs> uh, of group two volunteered, uh, which isn't a whole lot, but again, we're that's compared to only 2% from group one. So we're increasing the participation uh, seven and a half times more likely to participate. That's huge, right? Because uh, it's, you know, it's really easy to say yes when there's zero effort involved. It's just this hypothetical, vague, you know, abstract thing. But if you can get people to do this, then they'll be more likely to say yes when it actually requires effort, when it's actually the real world. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of like people asking like hyper conservative like chuds like healthcare questions in a really vague way, and then saying like that's Obamacare, and they're like, what? No, it isn't, and then it changes their mind. Oh, because you're just labeling it. Oh, right. Yeah. Because they're, they're, they're like, they get like a, a, a sort of like, oh shit, Obamacare. I hate Obamacare, but maybe they don't actually really know what that means. And then if you can just describe it to them without, without the label, they'll be like, uh, yeah, that sounds good. And then you say, oh, that's Obamacare. They'll be like, ah, oh, shit. Maybe, maybe that is okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. H has there been an experiment on that? Cause I, I, if there has been, I'm not aware of, it. I'm not aware of it. Um, I'm pretty sure. I, I I just said it was kind of like it. I don't think there was any experiment. Okay, but there I think there <laughs> probably has actually not specifically with with that what you were just saying, Nora. But I have heard of other things, other experiments like that with like 
uh, I can't remember the specifics right now, but like other policies, right? Where it was like, um, you know, I think there was like older studies. So it wouldn't have been Obama. It would have been some other fucking Democrat shit bag <laughs> or, or whatever it was. <laughs> and, and then people would be like, oh yeah, that sounds good. And then, you know, versus like, so you have one group where they hear who it is from and one group where they don't. And then like, and oh wait, I remember now it was, okay. It was like, um, oh no, I don't actually remember. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> I was getting excited for no reason. I don't actually remember. <laughs> I think it has something to do with global warming shit, but uh, I'll I'll probably just fuck it up if I try to. We're live streaming. I don't I don't want to try to <laughs> try to even. If it, if it helps any, I I kind of am slowly radicalizing my dad like that. Oh, like, nice. Uh, like so, like describing like socialism or anarchist things without telling yes. him that's what it actually is. Ah, oh, fucking and, right on, Nora. Yeah. How's it going? Is it uh, oh, it's going really good, surprisingly, because um, I, I don't know if you heard about the tragic like mass shooting in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, absolutely, um, I did. Yeah, that, that's uh, fuck. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of people were extremely mad at the police because they showed up in all this militarized gear and basically like begged the guy to surrender instead mm -hmm. of like storming in like their jobs are supposed to be. Yeah, it's, it's just the, the, you're talking about like the dual standard kind of thing. Like if it had been yeah. a black yeah, guy and, or something like that, more, more much more likely to have yeah, uh, yeah. burned burn right the, away, yeah. Right, they stood in, they sit around doing nothing for 50 minutes and like mm -hmm. the news called them heroes and stuff. When they didn't do anything, like the situation was oh, already resolved. There's so much propaganda know. about that. Like it's it's yeah. Absurd. And then they keep being, like like they they don't mention any of the other victims. I just keep noticing it's like they just keep talking about that one cop who died. It's yeah. like nine other people died, and they don't say anything about any of the other victims. It's just like oh, this one cop died. Oh, That's fuck. like the yeah. And and my dad, like a huge, he used to be like a huge cop supporter, would think they were these like heroes, right? And then he watched like the live stream and then he was like, and he called me later. He was like, you know what? I actually agree with you. The cops didn't do anything. And, yeah. <laughs> and it, it's something he would have never said before. And wow. So for, for him, that's a big step to say that. Yeah. Yeah. That's like massive. It's like, that's, that's it's, it was a shock that he, he admitted that to me, honestly, like I, I was not expecting that. Like, <laughs> well, I'm I'm glad you can you can be there to like uh, combine you know the horrible reality of current events with your own, uh, per, you know, uh, um, influence uh, you know and, and the things you're saying to him to try to help him interpret them in 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 better ways. So that's really cool. Congrats on that, and congrats to your dad for um, not being totally close-minded. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I've mostly had failures in my life with trying to persuade people to, to shift into better so, directions. Yeah, um, I, I think I think I've learned a lot from a person, um, who, who who's in my organization again. Like I can't yeah. stop talking about it, but um, they funny. live on basically a commune. But none of them will oh. say it's a commune, but it is a commune. <laughs> <laughs> and it's in denial. Full, yeah, it's full of like people who maybe used to be like right wing chuds were like three percenters and whatnot. But it's converted into a commune basically by this one person like um saying applying like actual socialist principles like hey like you help me i'll help you vice versa and now they run like a state now they all like own their means of production and wait but these are former like right-wing people yeah okay so they, yeah. they've discovered communism <laughs> but they won't <laughs> call it that independent independent discovery <laughs> <laughs> no, every, everyone agrees that she's basically just a communist at this point, but she won't actually admit it. Um, and, well, I mean, she did grow up in a cult 
um, wow. that was like a socialist or communist cult of some sort. Oh, so probably um, they now hate hate socialism or communism because yeah. of those experiences. Oh, that's yeah. really sad. Yeah. I'm but, sure that was horrible. Um, yeah. Um, but she, she's amazing. Um, that's great. Like, she, she's just radicalizing like everyone. She, she, <laughs> and oh like, God, I, I, I kind of learned from her a little bit. And I, I think that's when I really started changing my dad's mind was because she was radicalizing like actual right wing, yeah. wing like heads to become socialists. So if she can do it, you know, <laughs> then yeah. Well, that's that's a very I I she should have her on stream sometime. If, <laughs> yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> I, Maybe I'd be down. I, I find that story very in inspiring, you know, especially since she's been hurt so much by this, I'm sure, very fake and twisted, perverted, distorted version of something very beautiful, but taken in this really you know, messed up fucking way that, that then she learned to have a bad association with this idea of communism or socialism. And now she's discovered it, maybe not a name, but as something that is actually, you know, liberating and, and, and healing and, 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 and helpful to increase, to increase her own well being and, and that of her community. And that's just really beautiful. And that makes me really happy to hear that. <laughs> so that's yeah. great. Yeah. It, it's, it's amazing is what it is. Yeah, I might feel a very a glowiness in my solar plexus. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's awesome. I love it. So please give give her a props for me, like you know, boom. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or or a hug, whatever, whatever. Yeah. The, uh, anyways, okay. <laughs> um, okay. So where were we? Oh, right. Uh, we were talking about using a vague hypothetical commitment before uh, escalating to ask for a real commitment. So applying this to uh, movement building and social movements. Um, yeah, so basically you just do that. So for example, uh, you could ask someone, hey, you know, let, let, let's, let's say you're talking to a friend who you're trying to bring into your organization. You might just say, um, hey, you know, would you be willing to come to a meeting sometime? You know, come to a meeting one of these days. You don't give a specific date or anything and you know they'll probably say well maybe they won't say yes but they're more likely to say yes be, than if you ask them for a specific date or whatever because they'll be like yeah yeah sure I'll, I'll come to a meeting sometime you know how it is like when you ask someone hey we should get together sometime we should have coffee sometime they'll be like yeah 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 probably they don't actually mean it half the time but but then if you actually follow up on that and be like hey you know you said you would come to a meeting sometime uh well it's 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 this or you know you said you were interested in that it's well it's this saturday at 3 p.m are you able to make it and you know the the research shows that they will be more likely now to say yes and you know we could do this for any activity it doesn't just have to be meetings it could be any sort of action that you're trying to uh get people involved in um so the one caveat for this is don't be bossy you know just because someone said yes earlier when you were asking them hypothetically uh, we don't want to demand that they now say yes and be, you know, just because they said it before, um, both because, you know, we don't want to be an asshole. We don't want to be pushy, but also on a more practical level, uh, research studies show that people are more likely to say yes when they're asked the second time, you know, asked for real, uh, if, if they are being asked instead of told, because, you know, just people don't like being told what to do. It's that innate anarchist spirit that we all have. We all hate to be bossed around quite, you know, which is very justified. Um, okay, so the real life example that goes with this uh, of organizers and activists using this method, uh, it's very, it, it's, well, I don't know if it's very common, but it's, it's fairly common in labor organizing for organizers to sometimes do surveys with workers about what actions they would be willing to do before actually doing those actions. Uh, so the example we'll look at is hotel workers at the Marriott Hotel in San Francisco, California, USA. They were fighting for their first contract. They were already uni unionized uh, with the union Unite Here. Uh, and U Unite Here has many members in the hotel and service industry. Uh, so these workers, they won a contract in 2002, but winning that contract took years of struggle. 
uh, because management, surprise, surprise, were being very, very stubborn in the bargaining pr pr uh, process. They were they were just not making any progress. They were, you know, and the, the union organizers decided, well, fuck it, you know, we're not getting anywhere this way. So we need to mobilize our coworkers to take direct action to pressure the company because, you know, direct action gets the goods. Uh, so during this campaign, uh, workers who were taking, uh, you know, a very active role in organizing decided to survey their coworkers. Uh, they started by surveying them, asking them, are you willing to wear a pro-union button to work? So very low level, low risk, basic thing. And, a, you know, majority said yes. So then from there, they handed out the buttons and many people actually wore them. Uh, now, if they hadn't surveyed workers first before, you know, they could have just handed out buttons from the start without doing the survey first. You might think, well, that's a waste of time. Uh, the thing is, though, if they survey them, survey them first, people are more likely to say yes, because it's just a very vague commitment. Uh, and then from there, people will be more likely to actually wear them. And if they hadn't done that, maybe you'd have less people wearing them. And the point of the button is to, sh to make this show of strength, uh, both to fellow coworkers, to sort of build this morale and so on and build a sense of solidarity. And if you had only had like a minority of workers wearing the buttons, it could actually just end up being a show of weakness rather than a show of strength. So you wanna get as many people wearing them as possible. So doing that survey first helped increase the number of people who were wearing them. Um, and then so, also having more like starting people wearing the buttons got more people to say yes after that. After yeah. there was a lot of people were wearing the button. It yeah. reminds me of when you were talking at the beginning about people would put the small sign in the door and then that would like make them feel like, okay, I'm associated exactly. with this movement now. So yeah, like, that, that's interesting. Like uh, that's why I've always said, I mean, you know, I've had a lot of anarchists push back against this, but it's like, I, I, and you know, I get this from my marketing days, but like branding does matter, you know, and mm -hmm. having like a cool aesthetic. I mean, we, the problem is like, you have to thread the needle because you don't want it to become all about the aesthetic and the, tchotchkes and all that kind of stuff you want it to have depth and, and and meat to it you know what i mean but i do think that you still have to take into consideration things like symbols are very powerful for human beings absolutely you know, there's yeah. a reason that we have cave paintings you know where people are drawing on their walls like back when they were also like really struggling to survive you know aesthetics matter to human beings i think and um so i yeah. think we can have both at the same time where we can have buttons and pins and logos and, and slogans, but we just have to make sure that they represent something that goes deeper and that the movement doesn't. Yeah, that's something I think about all the time because it's like, it is a problem if it becomes all about the aesthetics, but I still yeah. think the aesthetics are still important. I think that's where the pushback comes from because there are those who will make it all about the aesthetics and the symbolism and, and yeah. that's where they'll yeah. stop. So obviously we don't want that. And, and I think, you know, it, a lot of us maybe encounter that kind of thing throughout our political participation and then yeah we just, yeah we get some well, that's reaction like the dnc like, right i mean the dnc yeah. is just slogans empty slogans and you know they come up with little or or the gop you know like the fucking red hat the make america gray hat you know it's like um although they actually did i would i would argue that there's more depth to the fascist republican movement than there is to the liberal movement but i guess that's another mm -hmm. discussion but um Regardless, uh, there, there are the, the, I guess the, 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 we have to look at the, we have to look at the Venn diagram of like the good things and the bad things. Cause like what's great about symbols and aesthetics is that they can unify us. They can, uh, inspire us. They can signal to each other, you know, like there, there are good things about it. And then there are bad things, which is where it's like, if people just sort of focus in on the aesthetics and don't take it any further, then that's obviously terrible. So it's a big yeah. topic, I guess, another, another topic, but that, it just kind of, no. This just sort of rung that bell in my mind. Yeah, I agree. We sh we shouldn't reject it. It is it is uh, in itself. It's 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 shitty. But if it's part of like a broader like movement that includes direct action and isn't just symbolism, then it is helpful for uh, facilitating or or encouraging you know that direct action and so on. Yeah, it, it has to be intentional. Better. I guess is the way to think about it. Right. Uh, okay, so again, with the with uh, talking about this example of the hotel workers and and survey the organizers sort of doing these surveys, the next survey they did was uh, with their coworkers was, are you willing to come to a demo outside of the hotel? And a bunch of people said yes. So they had this demo, and it was very well attended. Uh, so well attended, 
so well attended, in fact, that they decided to start having these demos every week, and that continued throughout the campaign. Uh, then later, they did a survey with their coworkers saying, would you be willing to have a, a brief strike? And a majority said yes. And because they had so many people saying yes in the survey, they then moved on to having an actual strike vote, like an official strike vote in the union. And again, a majority voted yes. Uh, so they had a two day strike from there. Uh, so these kinds of things continued. And finally, they won a contract in 2002 and they won the demands that they've been fighting for. Uh, so there you go. <laughs> um, so uh, I'd like to talk a little bit more about escalating tactics. We've already discussed escalating tactics and how this helps to draw people in, in terms of getting people to participate more, getting people to become increasingly comfortable with uh, bolder and bolder, more militant, more radical tactics. Uh, but it also has another benefit of increasing your chances of winning a class struggle. Uh, whether it's against your boss or a landlord or the city council, whoever you're up against, escalating tactics can help you. Um, so with escalating tactics, that means basically you don't just start with your strongest tactic and you also don't do just various actions in any kind of random order. You start with your weakest tactic. If that fails, then you escalate to a stronger tactic and then a stronger tactic and you keep on escalating until eventually uh, you win. So um, a benefit of escalating tactics is that it makes the boss or whoever you're uh, up against afraid of what's coming next. Because you know you keep coming at them with new things and each time it's even more intense. So the pressure to cave in that the boss or whoever it is feels is going to be really strong because they know that uh, you know it, well, shit. If this is what they're doing now, it's only going to get worse. So they're not just thinking about what's happening now; they're thinking about what you're going to do next. It's 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 sort of a form of psychological warfare. Uh, now, conversely, if you started with your strongest tactic right from the get-go, let's say that failed, that is going to be so demoralizing. The people in your movement they might just give up because they know we've already given it our best shot. And that didn't work out. So that's that's very demoralizing. So that's this is another benefit of using escalating tactics. Um, another benefit is you might actually end up winning a lot sooner and with a lot less effort than you might have anticipated. You know, you might have thought, oh, it's going to take us up here to win, but maybe you would actually end up winning just down here. And it's like, oh, that was easier than we thought. It's always better to win with less effort than with more effort. Um, and another benefit is that early on in your in your movement or your struggle you might not you just might not have the numbers that you might have not have enough people involved to do your strong tactics because strong tactics the stronger the tactic generally speaking not always but generally speaking you usually need more people in order to make it work um so if you're doing the, this ongoing use of escalating tactics you can gradually draw more people in so that by the time you're ready to use these stronger tactics you have more people involved in the movement giving you the numbers to use these strong tactics effectively. Um, so uh, there's a lot of different places you can read about escalating tactics, uh, but one resource I'll just recommend is so there's a video uh, by Libertarian Communist Platform, uh, who used to be called Libertarian Socialist Rants. You may have uh, heard of them, been around for a long time. They have a video called Workplace yeah. Resistance, a handy guide. And uh, this is one place you can hear a little bit more about this. So, yeah, uh, Radical Reviewer also has a few videos, like a, a few oh, great videos on um, workplace resistance and that sort of thing. We had a collaboration, I think it's on both our channels actually, um, that was specifically about this, but I think Radical Reviewer has like several videos. So that's a great resource as well. Um, nice. So yeah. Yeah, the, there's there's tons of great resources on this if, you, if you'd like to learn more. Uh, yeah, yeah. So for I our... Uh, what I think is great about this is like the amount of places you can use this in organizing. Like it can, like all these tactics can be used like nearly everywhere. Absolutely. Like, yeah. like people could throw in a speech, simply ask like, "Are you ready to do this?" That and people are going to say yes because they're not doing it at that moment. But like, it it feels bring that suggestion up so that people are more likely to do it in the future 
or something like, you know, even like at a smaller scale, like in a local org, like just getting an, an active member back on board doing more things. Yeah. Yeah, the, these things are adaptable for uh, hopefully any sort of uh, organizing or, or activism project that people are working on. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, so for the example, to go, uh, with this escalating tactics thing, uh, comes from, well, we already talked about the Quebec student strike. They used escalating tactics. Uh, we've already discussed that. Um, but another example, uh, is the Seattle solidarity network and they're, you know, they, well, they use escalating tactics all the time, but we're going to specifically look at, um, a fight that they had against uh, Nelson Properties, which is a property manage management company, you know, landlords. Uh, so what is Seattle Solidarity Network, also known as CESOL? It's a mutual aid organization of workers and tenants. They solve uh, grievances for, uh, at, in, at, for their members. Um, well, the members solve them for themselves, but like it's a collective thing. Um, so grievances that workers have against their ex-employers or that tenants have against landlords. And they do they, they address these grievances using collective direct action. So some of the things that they typically work on would be wage theft, uh, neglect by slum, slum lords or deposit theft by landlords or outrageous fees by landlords, predatory lawsuits by landlords um, or, or and, and, and things like that. Um, so Seattle so Solidarity Network is a directly democratic, all volunteer organization, and they have no central authority. So organized along anarchist lines, although you don't, you know, any anyone can join. It doesn't matter what your ideology is. Um, so there are many solidarity networks, um, but CSOL, I believe, is the first one, or if it's not the first one, it's at least one of the first ones. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, it was founded in 2007 by members of the IWW, or Industrial Workers of the World, uh, which is the radical labor union that's... Hell yeah! Hell yeah! Has been kicking ass for uh, over a hundred years. Um, Where are my wobblies at? <laughs> Wobbly sound off. Absolutely. <laughs> I also just shared a, uh, real quick, just because we're talking about workplace organizing tools, yep. the libcom.org slash organize yes. is a great uh, resource for workplace organizing. I'm so glad you shared that. And they have uh, organizing guides for the workplace organizing and also for community organizing and, and uh, just organizing in general. All if you, if, you, if you shared the link for the workplace organizing guide, then I think that you can access the other links from the same page. They should be easy to find. It's It's... Uh, it's a great yeah they resource. they put they used to have like them all over the site but now it's one page if you go libcom.org slash organize yeah it's got like a, a table of all the different guys oh libcom is so thank thank goodness for libcom one of the one of the greatest websites for like they have an archive of so many like articles and and like uh, on on theory praxis all kinds of things you can find there so please check them out uh and also also a, a chat forum which i used to frequent way back in the day uh, and, and learned a lot there. Uh, it's not as active as it used to be, but um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good place. Absolutely. Um, so solidarity networks very often or just typically use this, these escalating tactics when they are waging class struggle. Uh, but we're going to talk about uh, Seattle, solidarity, that Seattle Solidarity Network versus Nelson Properties, uh, the, you know, the, the landlord specifically uh, in a case to help uh, their member, one of their members, Maria. Now, Maria lived in an apartment owned by Nelson, and it was full of black mold. It was causing respiratory illnesses, eye problems, all kinds of things. And Nelson refused to clean the mold. And she was, you know, trying to get them to do it, but they just kept refusing. So she gave notice and she moved out. Uh, but Nelson just stole her $500 deposit and was pressuring her to pay $1,500 in fees that were completely illegitimate. Uh, so these are the escalating actions that Seesaw took against Nelson from start to finish. I'm gonna just quote from their pamphlet, uh, Building a Solidarity Network Guide. So I'm gonna say we, even though I wasn't involved, but this is just quoting from them. Okay, so 
we did the mass demand delivery. After that, we started the ongoing posting and reposting of do not rent here posters around many different Nelson buildings. Then we started door to door tenants rights discussions with current Nelson tenants. After that, we started a series of small pickets in front of Nelson's office. Then we delivered letters to Nelson's neighbors, warning them of a yet to be unnamed slumlord in their midst and promising to return en masse to discuss the problem with each neighbor in full detail. And we made sure that Nelson himself got a copy and then we won. So uh, this is a very good demonstration of caving in, of, of, of the landlord caving in due to fear of what's gonna come next because they promised we're going to be back and we're going to, you know, spill the tea, tell you what's up. And obviously Nelson did want not want his neighbors all knowing this shit. So he's like, ah, fuck it. Uh, I'll just, you know, cave in. So, yeah, that's a that's a good example of escalating tactics winning uh, in a class struggle. Um, so if you want to use escalating tactics in your organization um, and this is some basic tips for planning them in your strategy meeting. It's pretty simple. Basically, you just brainstorm all the tactics that you can think of uh, and just write them all down on, 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 on and, and then from once you have as many as you can think of, you rank them on two levels. First, uh, how much effort and risk is going to be involved like uh, for, for the members, for the, for the people who are doing this action? And second, how much impact is it going to have on the boss or the landlord or the, the government, whoever your opponent is in this struggle? Um, and the other piece of advice is do not ever let your opponent know when you've reached your strongest tactic. You know, do not let them know that. They'll Because if they know that you've reached the end of the rope, they'll be better able to endure it. They'll just think, well, okay, if I can get through this, I'll be cool. So... It's like how a strikes, you, you shouldn't have an end date for your strike. Yeah. Even if you know, like, we're going to run out of resources on whatever day, yeah. you don't announce that. Absolutely. Let them know that. Yeah. Keep, keep, keep and and even then, it could always change. Like, if your strike gets a lot of publicity yeah, or yeah. whatnot. Donations. Like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's a really uh, practical uh i love i love that very practical pragmatic advice like it's a specific exercise you can use i think that's great yeah um so there is a caveat though that goes with the escalating tactics thing um which is that escalating tactics is not always the best strategy uh for example if everyone is fired up to do something huge probably just go for it right like just think of some of the big uprisings in history that you know, may something really huge happen. If someone had got up and be like, actually, we need to start with like our weakest tactic and then move to the strongest one. No, 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 no. If people are just <laughs> ready to fucking go, don't hold them back. Let let them go for it. I mean- that, That's called a, a de-escalating tactic and people will uh, be yes. the cops. Oh. <laughs> in fact, yeah, I was going to say, in fact, cops and like, and like agent provocateurs will like specifically go in and use those tactics. Oh, do they? Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've seen it. I've watched it happen. I don't know if they were oh. cops or if they were like four chantrolls or whatever, but I've actually like seen that take place. And it's like very, it can be very disruptive if the people in the org don't, aren't savvy and haven't learned this kind of stuff, then like it's very, it can be very tempting because there's always something kind of scary about going hard and going big. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it, I think it's natural to be like a little bit afraid. And so when somebody comes in and they say, oh, here's something safer we can do yeah you know it's like there is a there's an inclination to sort of like consider that but like i think that's why it's really important for people to learn these kinds of mechanics and dynamics absolutely so they can not get bewildered yeah and 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 every situation is different i mean sometimes you you, you can't have like this cookie cutter solution all the time because sometimes people are fired up to do something huge and it actually isn't a good idea at that time because the the situation is such that if you go for it at that moment you'll 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 fail um you know uh fuck like oh there's an example that is like on the tip of my mind that i can't think of from from like from from the russian revolution or the like before the russian revolution i think the the july days or something like that but um anyways basically sometimes um if you're fired up to do something 
it's not always a good idea to go for it, but often it probably usually is. I don't know. You, you have to judge it from from whatever the situation is. But yeah, so so don't don't ever think that like escalating tactics is this like cookie cutter thing to always use in every situation. And also don't think that just because everyone's fired up to go for something huge is necessarily the best thing either. It really you have to you have to think about your specific situation. Um, and another thing. Got to read the I, room. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and there is one situation actually where it's probably, it, it would always be good to just come out swinging with your hardest tactic, no matter what, if there's a situation where we need to win today, because if we don't win today, tomorrow we lose all is lost. It's like this sort of last minute at the buzzer, like free throw from the fucking, uh, half court, like all or nothing thing. Like, you know, in those situations where like, there's a very short time limit on winning, you just need to jump into your strongest tactic, fight as hard as you can from the start. Um, I would argue we're kind of there globally right now. <laughs> yeah, <true. laughs> you know, like we we need to be taking risks. I think I I, yeah. I really do feel like everyone's so timid and like there's so many people, who, especially since Biden won the election, people are starting to go dormant because um, they feel like oh well you know Trump's out so there's nothing to worry about. But it's like no, the global climate change is coming. Fascism is stronger than ever. There's still cops killing people every day. Like like nothing's really changed just because Biden took office. Absolutely. And uh, and we're, we're the clock's ticking, so I do think we need to kind of go big more often mm -hmm. um, with the with all the things you're talking about in mind. But yeah, just just broadly speaking, I think that the clock is uh, running out on us. You know, you you are right about that. Uh, I wish you weren't, <laughs> but you are. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> as quickly as we can. <laughs> Escalate yeah. as quickly as we can with the foot in the door in the face. Yeah, we got to keep all this in mind. <laughs> keep it in mind. Be strategic and tactical, but uh, still, I, yeah, more risks would probably be better right about. True. Okay, so, um, so just a little advice for doing these techniques, um, in general. So with both the foot in the door technique and the door in the face technique, timing matters a lot. So. With the door in the face technique, which again is going from, hey, how about this big thing? Oh no, slamming the door in my face. Okay, well, how about a smaller thing? So with that, uh, you want to ask them to do the small thing right after they said no to the big thing in the same conversation. Basically, you got to strike while the iron is hot. Well, while the iron is hot, while the, that memory of them being like, uh, no, I'm not into that. Then, you know, ask right away. Okay, well, then how about the smaller thing? Like, you, you just, just jump right into it. Um, with the foot in the door technique, however, it's basically the opposite. You don't want to, you know, once people, someone has agreed to do something small, you don't want to then immediately be like, okay, how about this other thing? And then they say, yes. Okay. How about this other thing? You know, you're, you're going to really annoy them and push them away. Um, so you want to chill for a bit, hang back and wait before you make the, the next request. This is also um, good dating advice. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like you you want to go on a date? You wanna, uh, what are you doing right now? You want to get some coffee right now? <laughs> yeah. Don't you want to get married? Eager. You want to get yeah. married? <laughs> exactly. Uh, no. <Don't. laughs> yeah. So um at the same time though, you don't want to wait so long that like they've forgotten who the fuck you are. Like, you know, so you want to wait long enough that they've you know, that they don't feel harassed, but like, don't wait so long that the, that the momentum is lost either. So you sort of have to feel it out to see, to see what feels right for that person, for the movement itself, for what you're trying to organize and, and, and that situation. And uh, yeah, the other, yeah. yeah. Um, the other piece of advice is just don't be bossy. Don't be pushy. Don't be emotionally coercive. Uh, you know, there are both practical reasons and ethical reasons for this. Uh, you know, if people take on too much, they're going to burn out. Uh, and if they burn out, they're going to drop out. Or even if they don't drop out, if someone's burned out, they're not going to be as effective. Uh, it, either they won't be as effective in the movement, or even if they are, they're going to be less effective in some other area in their life. Maybe they're going to take it out in their family or their relationships, or maybe they're just going to start developing depression. We don't want to overburden anyone. We don't want to burn people out. Um, we want to respect people. We want to be caring about each other, about our about everyone. We want to care about them and be, you know, kind and respectful to them, but especially with our comrades who have, 
you know, are, are in struggle with us, we always want to show that respect. Um, so that's the, the ethical reason. And also on a practical level, there's research showing that the foot in the door technique and the door in the face technique are both less likely to work when people feel pressured. And actually reminding someone that they're free to say no increases their likelihood of saying yes. Uh, again, that anarchist inherent instinct we all have of fuck the police, fuck the bosses, <laughs> fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. We all kind of have that inside of us, uh, which is a good thing. So we don't want to be pressured, you know, um, something else I've, I've found out, uh, in when I'm, when I've been working and organizing is, um, if you have good relationships with other orgs, uh, that are like kind of allies, maybe they're doing different things, but they're like allied or aligned with you. Um, this is just a total aside, but if you find like somebody is kind of like, just, you basically get the sense that you've lost them from your particular action or group or whatever, you could always just say like, oh, you know, you could kind of like direct them to another group that might be more in line with what they want to do or their interests or something like that. So that's why it's good to kind of have contacts with other groups. And because right. I've noticed that you can kind of feed people back and forth. Like there might be somebody who's like really into like web development and it's like, you just don't have any web development stuff for them to do right now. So you can be just like, well, you know, oh, right. this group over here needs that. So like, that's kind of like a last ditch thing you can do if you feel like you're really just about to lose somebody from your specific yeah. group. And that way you don't lose them completely to, from the movement. That's that's a very good point. I like that you bring up also like what is what is that person actually interested? What are they what are their talents? What are their interests? What do they feel comfortable doing? Because sometimes what seems like a big ask or small ask might actually be smaller or bigger depending on what that person is into. So maybe something that seems like a big uh, a small ask might be a big ask for someone if they're not comfortable with that kind of thing. But what seems like, you know, and, and vice versa, right? Like something that seems like a big ask for them is not a big deal because they actually love doing that. So actually like connecting with that person as an individual, finding out what they like, what they what they feel comfortable with and so on. Yeah, can, can, yeah so so that, that's a very good point. Just don't like, like we should never, I think this goes without saying, but it's worth it, I guess it bears saying like, these are not like cogs in our machine. Yeah. <laughs> Even if we are a collective and we're working like with a flat hierarchy, like we're still all people, we're all, we're all humans and like not losing sight of that. Yeah, which can absolutely. actually be difficult when you're in the middle of a really frantic, you know, operation or action or something like that. Like it could just, you can sort of get into this mode where you just see people as like assets or resources. Yeah. Even if you're worried, like, again, I'm telling you, I've, I, this is even in groups that have like no hierarchy at all. I've mm -hmm. seen where that sort of happens. Um, so we just have to remember like every so often take a breath and remember, okay, these are all human beings. They all have mm -hmm. other things that they have that are happening in their lives. You know, just, just keeping track of that is, is good. Yeah, remember, remember the human. Don't, don't, don't dehumanize each other. I think is what you're saying. Um, yeah, don't, don't treat exactly. each other as, as you said as cogs in the machine. Like uh, we all Precisely. have our own shit going on. We, 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 you know, um, and pressuring people in in these in these intense intense ways. It's it's, it's it is disrespectful. Um, you know, it it we want to respect people's autonomy, uh, respect their limits, respect their boundaries, and respect. Yeah. And, and just remember that, yeah, have that human connection. Um, now, I For think sure. it is okay to, and, and in fact, not just okay, but good and a positive thing to nudge people without being pushy. So like a, a gentle push. Yeah. Uh, now, an example of that would be like things like, I believe you can do this. You know, you're valuable to this organization. Things like that, that are encouraging and are sort of like, you know, a friendly little push without like a being of sort of bossy kind of, push. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people when they come into an organization for the first time, have very little confidence <laughs> in themselves. Yeah. And like, they really don't know what to do. And they're like, I, I, I hear it a lot again, and again, it's like, I really want to help, but I have no idea what I'm doing. I, and I'm afraid I'm gonna mess things up. And it's like, uh, I one thing I, I don't know, this is like, I guess we're talking about advice. And this is something I learned. Um, from uh, when we were doing like homeless outre outreach back, in, it was this was like a liberal charity org, but still I saw this was effective. Was you know find inexperienced people and experienced people and kind of like pair them together, hmm. so then you have like kind of a mentor relationship, um, and and that that gets people running pretty quick because they could just kind of directly observe uh, somebody who kind of already has the ropes. Um, that's 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 been effective. That sounds uh, like a great idea. What, where did you experience. learn this? 
I don't even want <laughs> uh, from the from the United Way. I used to do some stuff with the United Way, which is like a super super liberal uh, yeah, org. But they're pretty good at volunteer um, management, though. So yeah, it's very I mean, much it, the opposite of what I what I advocate for now. It's very like hierarchical and liberal and like funded by philanthropists and shit like that. But um, but as far as like they had a ton of volunteers and they were really good at mobilizing them very quickly and getting people up to speed very quickly. Like that was something that they were really good at. And I learned that yeah. from them. So they would take like a group if they had like, if they had like, cause they would have these huge events and they have like a hundred volunteers and like 90 of them would have no experience. It'd be their first time. Cause like the turnover is really high. You have a lot of people who show up one time and never come back. And so they'll break them into teams where it's like one experienced people and nine inexperienced people. And that's usually pretty, pretty good. Now the, the danger is, if you're it, the, the other thing about the United Way is that those ops tended to be kind of like short term, not sustained. The, the the danger is in a sustained long term environment. You don't want it. You don't want that to develop into a hierarchy where like that mentor becomes like the mm, boss. You don't right. want that to happen. So yeah, so you, you need, need sort to, of a transition out of that somehow. Yeah, and that was the problem with the United Way is that it got very, yeah. you know, hierarchical and stuff like that. So anyway, uh, well, but, yeah. Well, I'm sure there were other reasons that was happening and not just that. But I, yeah. I I do like that idea of like having someone um, I guess maybe just putting a time not I mean not a strict time limit on it like 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 you know maybe a, a period where it's like okay usually it's about this long and then after that you sort of check in okay do you feel comfortable sort of you know and yeah. that close association uh, uh, and then you know try to encourage them to then become a mentor to someone else you know the, the new person right. and, and and rotation's um, probably a, a good uh, absolutely yeah a good solution to that and then just rotation. you know trusting people people get up and running with that kind of stuff pretty quickly usually this stuff is not really that complicated especially the on the ground stuff i mean nora do you agree with with that it's like most of the time after like a couple of weeks people can really start to become autonomous if they're given the right tools and education and everything I don't know if Nora stepped away. Oh, oh, yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> um, I was just, I'm just thinking. <laughs> you got me, you got me thinking like so hard about like just like how I can do this in like every single situation. <laughs> yeah, which uh, is a good thing, I guess. I I just feel like I'm like you know young organizer me again. <laughs> <laughs> rejuvenated that's yeah. good is that what you mean yeah oh that's um, awesome yeah um i i just i just feel like like a lot of these skills like are lacking on the left because like a lot of the a lot of, of the protesters are younger and they don't necessarily have like the same like organizing experience or anything um so people tend to get very frustrated and like these like very young spaces where the movement is still kind of new and fresh and um they kind of like get caught up on things like we don't have the numbers like people aren't showing up anymore blah 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 stuff like that I I've been reading lately, Nora, about labor colleges that, that used to they used to be these like really awesome, well coordinated schools where they would teach people like organizing principles and you know activism tactics and strategies and also just like how to fix cars and stuff like just totally non organized. It's, but they had these like labor colleges that were just totally dedicated to training unionists um, and activists. And I think that's something we kind of like like because imagine like. This just this video right now could be a training module. I think you know with Lucky Black Cat's great uh, presentation here. Like if you had just like a, a a labor college that had resources like this, like the organizing uh, materials from Libcom. If you put all of these together into a package, and then maybe had some people who's just like L Lucky Black Cat was saying, you know, you have an inreach committee. You could also have like a education committee that teaches people these kinds of principles and stuff like that and makes these resources available. I think that would be really valuable for any organization. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I would love to see something like that. Um, yeah. I, I, I guess the one thing holding me back from like making videos like that is like, <laughs> I feel like such a poser, like, cause I, I don't really have organizing experience. Like I'll, I'll take along to like shit that other people have organized. 
but like I've only just studied in like abstract. So it's like, who the fuck am I to like, you know, put on some? Well, that's it's this, valuable though. I mean, this, I, and felt I, think... like, I felt like, should I even come on your stream? Like, you know, <laughs> like, do I, I no, really like, like we need I all of like, it. <laughs> I think we need all of these different, like we need people who are studying it academically. We need people who like Nora has been in the trenches and like, you know, fighting it. But now look what's happening. Like you're, you're giving Nora, like, like we're watching this happen in real time. Like Nora is like an experienced activist in the trenches. And then you're bringing in this academic information yeah. and it's like rejuvenating Nora. You know what I mean? Like we're watching this happen. So and then Nora can give you feedback, you know, so that you could bring that into your academic work. I mean, you know what I mean? It's like, I, just I think this is really valuable. I wouldn't call it, not that I'm trying to diss academics, but I wouldn't call it academicness. Although like the social psychology stuff is academic, but like, I think even more important is learning from the real life struggles that other organizers, activists, mass movements like that. That is like sure. the real, um, yeah. you know, shit that we need. I to guess be analytic, from. analytic, not, yeah, not academic, but just, analytic. Just basically yeah. like, 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 um, leeching off the lessons of other people. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, that's vital. Yeah. That's See, a like, big part of. Yeah. My yeah. whole thing was like, I'm always like trying to do jump to like, you know, our, our most risky strategy first, like mm -hmm. we're our biggest strategy and trying to figure out ways to get people on board. But like, this makes it kind of like easy for me to see like a path line to get people onto, on board to, you know, the riskiest or best strategy that you have. Yeah. Yeah. And like, because I, I already know for a fact that like all the strategies before them don't work. Like mm -hmm. as we've seen, like, you know, like just simply raising awareness, signing petitions and stuff like that doesn't really do anything. But yeah. it does in the sense that you get people on board with the movement. And I think that's very yes. powerful because that's something yeah. that we're always struggling with is getting people on board with you know, they're more risky strategies, so it can be like an inside thing. Like, we, we hey, we know the end goal is to do this thing, but we know we can't do it unless we get people on board to do it. So, yeah, yeah, like, yeah as long as you can also be doing things simultaneously. So, Sorry, like, um, because oh, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> there's no, 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 delay, please, please. so I don't, I don't even know. Yeah. Um, but like, yeah, that's another thing that I learned, uh, with the more liberal activism, but what they're really good at is having like. They, they, they're they really good at the management of like personnel basically um so that they'll have um multiple campaigns going on at the same time and then when a volunteer comes in they can drop them into the channel that like makes sense for them so like if uh if somebody comes in and they're like hey i just moved from another state and i did a bunch of activism there and i know a lot of stuff and then they'll, they'll be like okay well we can put you into this campaign which is like really aggressive you know what i mean or if somebody comes in and they're like hey i'm 18 and i want to get involved for the first time and i don't know anything they'd be like oh well you can hand out flyers you know like they, they they have all these different things happening that can get like that and in those organizations i worked with back in the liberal days um it can get hugely bureaucratic so like that's mm. again another thing to be worried about but yeah. i think the basic idea of having like you know trying to manage it so that you have something for everybody to do as much as is practical considering your circumstances. I mean, the other thing about these organizations is that they had and wasted a lot of money. So like, <laughs> you have to be careful, you know, like they got a lot of money from like we don't got donors money and then they wasted a lot. <laughs> right, yeah. So we yeah, have to, we have to be obviously mm -hmm. adjust these tactics for our circumstances, but um, it's just something I noticed that they did. I also really like this uh, comment um, from Anathematic. Never let inexperience prevent you from gaining experience. Uh, ah, that's very good. I love that. I'm going to use that. Thank you, uh, Anacomatic, or how, how do you say it? <laughs> uh, anathematic. Anathematic, thank anathematic. you. Anathematic. Yes. Yeah, that's good. Although, uh, by the way, sorry, I just want a very quick side note. Uh, I, had, I had like my notes on the screen before, which I had in the center, so it didn't look like too much like I was staring from the camera. And I had like the uh, view screen of you, EJ, and Nora off to the side. So when you were talking, I was often looking to the side. I don't want you to think that I was like, looking to the side because oh, no. I wasn't in what you were saying. That's why I wear sunglasses. I was I don't like want trying to know like, where I'm looking. <laughs> look at you, you know, while you were talking, but it probably just looked like I was like bored and like staring off to the side. Like I was actually just looking <laughs> at you. 
I don't want anyone to like. Feel I'm used to that. No. That's just my mode of operation. So. <laughs> now, that I'm, now that I'm done, like the notes, I've put you in the center again. So now I'm like, get to like. All right. I like being in the center of attention. That's, that's good for me. Okay. <laughs> If you haven't noticed, <laughs> no, I, I'm I'm used to people fair enough to decide because we got all the online like like um, Zoom and Dipsy oh my gosh, I've got four yeah. screens right now that I'm having to yeah, it's it's normal. What a weird world we live in. <laughs> um, yeah, so. Uh, I guess, yeah, let's, is, uh, you want to keep moving with your presentation? Oh, by well, the way, everybody in the chat, we have about, oh, go ahead. Where are we on the well, presentation? I was, I was just saying that, that that's pretty much, well, I had like one note left, but sort of just reiterating the bottom line of that thing I said, which is that uh, you want people to feel free to say no. You don't want to make them feel bossed around or that it's unacceptable to say no. But I basically already said that. I was just saying the same shit again. So uh, yeah. I'm pretty much done my presentation. The only thing left in my notes is talking about my YouTube channel and, and fuck that shit. You know, I'll say that before I leave, but you know, uh, we don't need to say that right now. So. <laughs> no, no, I think that that point yeah. is very uh, Well, we got about. Oh. Yeah, I was just saying, um, I think that point is very important because mm. a lot of socialist orgs can be extremely manipulative. Yeah, the, to, the it that where it, to the point where you know people totally get like washed out from the movement, and mm -hmm. I think it's very important to recognize that and not be like extremely pushy. Where use these tactics to basically manipulate people. Yeah, and to doing absolutely things. Not. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, where did, oh, suddenly. I'm, I'm having, I have to restart my sound uh, card because it's screwing up. So I'll be right back. Okay. But yeah, it, exactly. And I, and I think like, I actually like one of the, I had so many anxieties about coming on this live stream. Most of them were like egotistical, like I'm going to screw up and I'm going to suck. But like one of the anxieties I had about coming on here was like this information you know, can be used for good, can be used in a way that's not been, not manipulative, that, that is honest, that is respectful, that is about not using it for your own purposes, but for our collective good and for including the good of the people that you're, you know, trying to uh, draw in to participate. But unfortunately, it could also, you know, be used in bad ways. And I was like, do I really, like, I don't know, I, I you know, one of the anxieties I had was like, what if, you know, some person's listening to this and they use this information for bad purposes and like I kind of I, my I've struggled up. with that in the past um, yeah. because of I talk a lot about like my marketing experience and propaganda mm -hmm. and stuff like that and that could absolutely be used for evil you know I know um, which is one scary. of the reasons why well I think I think that just like every time we talk about it we have to bring that up I think it's important and like it, it's why it's why I think it's one of the reasons why I call what I do very openly propaganda. And mm -hmm. I and I have a video on propaganda where I talk about like the original definition of propaganda was just persuasive communication. And then yep. like the the way that it, the, the meaning of propaganda today, the way people use it, like in like, I guess, like whatever you want to call it, like common language, um, it's kind of got a propagandistic element to it. That it's an interesting history because like after World War One. World War One was like the first war where they really had like a scientific application of propaganda. And then in the wake of World War One, in the twenties, a lot of people started to use propaganda in this like mm. in this like uh, euphemistic way to say like, oh, I don't practice propaganda. You know, I'm just a communicator. I'm I do public relations. I do blah 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 blah. But yeah. um, you know, I think we should just call it propaganda because like, and, and we should normal try to normalize that definition of, of propaganda because um it is dangerous you know it's 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 a uh, it is something where the only way I, I the only uh way to counterbalance the danger of it is to try to educate people you know on how the dynamics work and i think you know letting everyone know in your organization right off the bat like hey we're using this uh concept of foot in the door we're using this concept of door in the face we, yeah. we used it on you you know that's how we got you involved here yeah yeah exactly right is 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 important yeah honesty transparency I, yeah like i i think it's like you could also like maybe give people the tools 
to deal with like maybe like bad actors like using yes. it in a bad way like yes. for example mm -hmm. teaching people how to recognize like bad propaganda and why it's bad and why it's doing harm or like yeah. maybe teaching people to recognize when an organization is maybe manipulating you like maybe they're asking you to do something that's too much like you, you have to start putting things on the sideline. Like you start have to be doing other things that you just, you can't keep up. Right. And yeah. Um, things like that. So basically like a sort of education for defending yourself against these kinds of forces. Yeah. Yeah. I, think um, that's, yeah. I, yeah. I would love there that. Could, yeah. There could also be like an argument for just like telling people with words that are known to use like very manipulative tactics. Um, but I just don't want to start beef with people right now. So <laughs> I'm not going to do that. <laughs> yeah. But, but education is, is like vital for our movement, I think. And um, mm -hmm. I'm actually doing a lot of uh, research about this right now for a, a book that I'm writing, but like, we, you know, if we want to have a flatly hierarchical organization, that means that everybody, to whatever extent we can make it possible, needs to be like sort of an autonomous unit that's making decisions based on the best information we can make available to everybody. You know, so like uh, if you don't want to have a top down hierarchy, it means you have to have a degree of transparency and information freedom that yeah. you don't have in like the right wing or even with like liberal organizations. So everyone needs to kind of as much as possible, know what they're doing and why they're doing it and have agency over what they're doing as, as much as we can swing that. Um, yeah, there, there, I mean, I think I think it's so hard, even like if you look at like the history of, of, of when anarchist organizations got really big in revolutions like the CNT in, in anarchist revolutions, even people with anarchist ideology who are committed to freedom, to lack of hierarchy, to like, um, you know, mass participation, even in, a, in, in in these situations can drift towards a sort of authoritarian way of operating. Um, so I, I think it's very important to have all those things in place because like it's, it's a constant, it's a constant risk of, 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 of that happening. Um, yeah. And, you know, so, so having, having the sort of in, like, I guess you would call it what you were describing, maybe like the infrastructure or, or structures to facilitate that lack of hierarchy. We, we really need those in place as a sort of safeguard. Uh, Winnie P said, I think that turning the human experience into a flowchart isn't the best practice. If I was told I was introduced to a movement via tactic, I would feel dehumanized. I I mean, here's the thing. I, I see what, yeah. what you're saying. I do think, though, that like that whether we like ignore the science or not, the science is there and other people will use it. And it's like... Uh, for better or worse, people like, you know, people have these modes that we operate in, you know, and understanding it is not such a bad thing. And we want to be as effective as possible. I mean, there's a reason that, uh, you know, like marketing companies spend billions of dollars on these kinds of, you know, learning how to manipulate people is so that they can be dishonest and force people to do things that are against their own interests. But what, but what they don't do is they never tell you what they're doing. You know, like Coca-Cola will never say, hey, here's exactly how we manipulate you into buying Coke. But I think that, it, you know, that's why the transparency is so important. So it's like, uh, you know, we need to make the information available and know what we're doing and be conscious about it and make other people conscious about it as quickly as possible. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't use tactics that are effective just because we know that they're effective. Does that make sense? Like, I, I, I it feels... Very yeah. counterproductive to say, like, we're not going to use these tactics specifically because we know they're effective. Like, that just doesn't make sense I, to me. It's kind of like a gun. You know, like a gun isn't a, a gun can be a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, you know, any weapon can be used for good or for evil. Um, does Am I making any sense? I don't, I don't well, know. Well, I, I, I do agree with. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Nora. Sorry. Oh, yeah. I was just saying I agree, um, except for the part that Coca-Cola did advertise what they did. It's right in the name. <laughs> <laughs> okay well then they haven't advertised it since like 1890 or something or whatever they <laughs> that's a cocaine joke uh, that, that's why <laughs> santa is the mascot of coca-cola because santa brings the snow <laughs> <laughs> all right coca-cola is a bad example mcdonald's 
just to speak to what, is, yeah go ahead just to speak to what winnie p has said okay so ej and 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 uh, i agree with you i mean uh obviously i would agree because i wouldn't have come and done this presentation if 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 i didn't at the same time i really fucking sympathize with what winnie p has said because yeah me too even just, as i read this comment to myself on a gut level like i feel it like it feels kind of dirty right like it feels kind of gross like uh all these like tactics of like persuasion and stuff like it it I don't, I don't fucking like it. Like, I really don't fucking like it. But you know what I like even less? Capitalism. And the way it's yes. fucking everything over, you know? It's, and, and all the forms of oppression that we're facing and, and all the, mini, on all the propaganda, like dishonest propaganda that is used and leveraged in service of capitalism and in service of racism and sexism and transphobia and every form of oppression ableism everything that is the fucking worst and and like anything i know like i don't want to be like some ends justify the means kind of thing because you can definitely take that too far but like i think that just understanding human psychology and and, and using it in a way that is effective, but also, well, as, as both of you had brought up, keeping that human connection, keeping the human respect that we have for each other, being honest, transparent, uh, respecting people's boundaries, not being pushy, doing all of that and caring about each other and loving each other, you know, if, if that we, you know, that, it, that it's okay to do, to yeah. use these insights, as long as we, as I, I think we don't want to get into a mindset, uh, EJ, as you mentioned, of seeing people as these sort of cogs, these sort of pawns on a chessboard, yeah. which maybe my we don't presentation, want to get cynical about it. Yeah. yeah, maybe my presentation made it sound like some fucking pawn on a chessboard thing. I really hate that. I don't want this to be about that at all. We are all equal and humans just trying to interact together. But I think if we have insights about how to effectively interact with each other to inspire each other maybe we shouldn't think of it as persuasion but inspiration and encouragement to do what we all need to do to liberate ourselves that's so, yeah that, that, so we, we, we don't have to be cynical to be aware of how these things work and use that like like the way i look at it is this is that whether we use these strategies or not uh our enemies will and they're going to be a lot more yeah. cagey about it. They're going to be a lot more dishonest about it. They're never going to tell you how they're operating. I mean, they're never going to admit it. You know what I mean? And um, and we're fighting a liberation struggle to try, like specifically, we're, we want to end this shit altogether, like all of this kind of mass scale manipulation. And the more we educate people, by the way, about how this stuff works, the less effective it's going to be. I mean, it's like... Um, when, yeah, when you true. learn how the sales funnel works, yeah. like like I, I I think I was kind of more susceptible to the sales funnel before I got into marketing. But now, as soon as I see an advertising pop up, I can see exactly what what they're trying to do, and it makes me much less susceptible to it. You know, like when you've worked in advertising for years and years and years, it be, you become less susceptible to it. But like as long as our enemies are using this to try to oppress people, I think it's fair game for us to use them to try to liberate people as long as we're being honest about it and and like I was saying educating them about how these processes work and saying immediately like mm -hmm. this is our strategy this is what we're doing and this is why we're doing it and 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 our end goal is liberation so that people won't be prone and vulnerable to this kind of manipulation so I don't know if that makes sense yeah. or not but to me it's I like so. it's we're trying to like, dismantle this whole system it's kind of like that's the end goal. It's kind of like how Amazon like lied about the piss bottle thing, and mm -hmm. it, like it motivated more people to like actually get involved and like um, I don't I don't know where I was going with this, but like it's just like Amazon is using all these dirty tactics to like to press like how bad like the working conditions are right and people mm -hmm. already knew about the freaking piss bottles like people already knew about that it was like news over and over and over again but mm -hmm. what people didn't know was like how bad it actually was and as soon as they realized that they're like oh yeah no no like now i'm and because like they realized like these tactics that amazon has been using to kind of like suppress you know the movement and suppress 
the working the workers and keep the this information quiet. Yeah. Right. They again the perfect example of the enemies of the working class and really all humanity when you think about it using manipulation to fuck us over and and dishonesty and and yeah piss bottles and also diapers is another thing that some amazon workers have, have to do to get through their shift can you fucking yeah. imagine that having to fucking do your it's bad enough to get through a day of work without being stewing in your own piss and shit like the i mean the thing about it is is it's Christ. like it the the uh i mean the warehouse workers are like it's like it's like uh everything that capitalism says socialism does it's a projection of like something that capitalism actually mm -hmm. does like yeah. we say that like oh communist countries like force people to work and they're and they're monitored at all times and they're constantly under observation and they're being emotionally manipulated but it's like look at look at getting a job at an average well, corporation to the, you have to, to do the, a personality to the that test. happens it's because capitalism exists in those countries to at least to some degree <laughs> Well, I would I would argue that like capitalism, that working for a corporation today, living in the USA today, I mean it's 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 exponentially worse than like the worst accusations we that have ever been lobbed at communism because like you're I don't think that uh, you know I, I didn't live in the USSR or whatever, and I'm not trying to be an apologist for that mode or whatever, but like everything that the capitalists have ever accused the USSR of, they're doing today like way worse i mean like i think that mm -hmm. like an amazon warehouse worker has far worse working conditions is under more observation is more psychologically manipulated and abused yeah. than a so you know a, a typical when, soviet when i worker. hear about like amazon warehouse workers conditions i'm like how is this not like some story out of charles dickens or some shit? You yeah, know? Like, ex yeah like, exactly yeah exactly and, the the and that's history we shouldn't forget either because obviously capitalism has a long history of of yeah. just like and completely I, and tormenting people and i love how the so-called fucking ancaps want to go back to like uh pre uh you know government intervention she's like oh have you read have, have you seen what the industrial revolution was like in the early days before like i mean not that the government is some great fucking liberator or some shit but anyway, <laughs> like, well no those were unions i mean like there there was a liberating force and that was unions I yes mean, absolutely the like, to the extent the government has day. adopted these like uh positive things for the working class it's because we have Fought for them and fought forced them to and do bled. it. Yeah, and maybe Absolutely. in some other and as, sometimes other countries would adopt them without that, but it's just because that happened in other countries and they wanted to get ahead of the movement. So because they were, you know, they're they're afraid of the movement happening there, or they just like feel like the pressure from the international stage of like looking bad or whatever. Yeah, but yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, and the, we and have the, we have because we fought for it. And the thing is, too, there's a long history, by the way, uh, just to circle back to the. Uh, last topic about, you know, whether or not we should use these tactics. I mean, the unions used to be experts at recruiting and educating and uh, propagandizing, you know, in the, in the neutral, ver you know, the neutral uh, sense of that word. Um, they, they, we had all this trade craft and the problem is, I think, you know, and this is totally off topic and I guess the topic for another discussion another day, but, um, that's been gutted into what we now call the modern trade unions, which, I mean, I know that mm -hmm. they do work. That's, they do a good work, but it's not like the, the IWW today is what all of those unions were like, you know, back around the yeah, well, early 20th century. You unions, unions have, you know, in, in many ways have become, uh, well, I don't, I don't want to say they're like, you know, the thing that's stopping the working class from rising up because the momentum's not really there. But if the working class did yeah. rise up, the you the mainstream unions would not be on our fucking side. And there are oh, yeah. examples historically that show that, like the the France 1968, uh, which started as a student strike, kind of like in Quebec, but then like you know escalated into maybe one of the well. Now that India, I think India has now displaced France as being the biggest. Uh, worker strike in history but i think at the time it was the biggest worker strike in history of like a you know at uh 10 million or i don't i i, I forget i can't remember the numbers but like the the fucking uh cgt and, and other unions 
like they they actually like suppressed the movement they suppressed yeah. the strikes they tried to manipulate people into in like instead of like they, and i won't get i i can't remember all the deals right now. i'm not even gonna try to explain <laughs> but like they well, just, yeah they were not they were not on the side of escalating that movement to anything revolutionary or even to like radical you know large reforms they were trying to damp shit down because at the end of the day they're they're a compromising force they're trying to create better conditions for workers within capitalism and yeah. it's better for workers to be unionized than not to be unionized no matter what kind of shitty union you're in but you know it, it unions are a weird mainstream unions not the iww not like true syndicalist unions but like mainstream business unions are sort of like you know they're they're sort of frenemies are they on yeah. our side? Are they not on our side? It's a little. Eh. There was, I mean, the big split that, that that caused the IWW split with the trade unions was over the fact that the trade unions like got all the communists out of their unions. You know, like they they banished them. And I think that, well, I know that like in 2020, uh, there were a few. Like I know that the um, Teamsters actually did a huge strike on the West Coast, and it's I think it was the biggest strike in 2020. It was they shut down the whole West Coast. And it cost like a billion dollars in trade on one day. So I don't want to discount that. The Teamsters did a great job there. Yeah. But Te like the, the majority are, of the are, action. Are more, more, okay. Sorry, I was just saying Teamsters are usually cooler than most uh, businesses. <laughs> oh, yeah. I used to work with them a lot. And in a film, lot of the long film shore, sets. the long shore, uh, uh, long shore. That's who I was actually. Actually, that was the longshoreman. I mean, that, now that I think about it, I, I think, the longshore yeah. people. They need to update Wait, sorry, that. I, I, <laughs> but I, don't, I, don't, the, I actually know about the, the Teamsters. Maybe I think I meant the Longshore from, from I don't know. I was, I was I actually, when I said the Teamsters earlier, it was the Longshore Union that think, shut down I the West Coast. I actually think that, 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 that's what I meant. That's why I said Teamsters, but I was like, wasn't it the Longshore? Yeah, that's why. I, I think I said Teamster yeah. first, so actually, I'm sorry Teamsters about that. Teamsters are but. sort of like <laughs> not infiltrated and shit. <laughs> no, I'm less familiar with the about them. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how but, um, they are. I, I think they're cool. Yeah, but the. Uh, I mean, I actually knew mm -hmm. a lot of Teamsters when I worked on film sets. But oh yeah, they they were they were pretty cool. But I, I didn't talk to them about politics at all at the time. But uh, mm -hmm. anyway, the 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 point is that uh, most of the strikes you saw in 2020, those were like either IWW, IWW did a ton of strikes in 2020, um, or like independent workers councils, or like with a lot of the sanitation strikes, they were strikes that happened in spite of the union apparatus or like outside of the union apparatus, like they were yeah. unionized, but the union actually didn't recognize the strikes they were having. So um, isn't the IWW very Anglo centric? I don't know if it is or not, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was. I mean, you know, um, there's another, there isn't, you know, wait, I know a little bit about this. There's another organization and I don't remember the name. I think it's the CF. Do you know what I'm talking about, Nora? They're like, or, or, or Lucky Black Cat. They're like, uh, there's a European and I think they mostly do Spanish, it's like the uh, Spanish language sphere, but they're affiliated with the IWW. Unfortunately, you know I don't about? know. Somebody in the chat might know. know, but yeah. But anyway, they they, they have a connection with the uh, more Spanish language oriented, and um, I think they're in Europe and South America more. So I, I think there's, a, there's an alliance. I, I yeah. do see CIT. More Thank more. you, Salami. The CIT. That's correct. Yeah. So if you want to learn okay. about uh, that, you can check out the CIT. Do you see more and more orgs popping up that are supporting strikes for, you know, like BIPOC people as well? Um, that are more yes. centered towards those people. I mean, the Amazon uh, union efforts are mostly, it's like a black led thing, right? Isn't that mostly yeah. uh, black workers most are leading that? So. Yeah, most people would be black or marginalized in some way. M yeah. Not m my specific warehouse, just because of where it is, but. Yeah. Do you work mm -hmm. at Amazon, Nora? Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. We, yeah, oh my we, God. So you you do work in the warehouse? Um, no, I okay. I work as a driver. Um. Wow. Holy yeah. shit. So so do you? How much contact do you have with warehouse workers as a driver? Um, not very much at all. Okay. Um, they they purposely uh, yeah. make it so. That yeah. contact is limited, even with like that. other other warehouse workers. Like their contact is very limited with each other as well. Yeah, so God. it's like yeah, it, it's like By it's design. just very, yeah. Fucking hell. Well, um, do you have? Are are you just like basically completely isolated from all your coworkers? As, uh, as a um, not completely. Like um, my uh, I'm not isolated from my DSP. However, my DSP is made up of a lot of three. Sorry, the, your what? Your DSP? What is that? DSP, Sorry, um, uh, delivery service 
provider. Okay. It's basically um, a contracted company. All Amazon delivery drivers, except for if you work under a DSP. Um, so most of the branded trucks you see, the vans and trucks, like um, the Amazon vans are working for a DSP. Um, the reason they do this is two factor. The first one is if um, a DSP ever unionizes independently, they immediately cancel their contract. That happened successfully once, and that company was terminated the same day they unionized. And um, okay. and the other reason is for low accountability. So um, because of the like how fast we're forced to work and whatnot, if drivers are speeding like ridiculously over the speed limit. Um, Amazon doesn't get in trouble for that. The DSP does. Okay, um, so it, it's sort of like the way Nike and so on will they contract uh, these factories that they're not actually like Nike factories or whatever. They're like sort of subcontracted kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And then when there's labor violations, they're like, ah, it wasn't us. It was them. It's like, ah, oh, fuck you. It yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like a shit. Yeah. It's like a shell company, basically. I mean, like yeah. you can think of it that way. Um, yeah, we we we. we we're basically Amazon. I always say I work at Amazon because the DSP does nothing but keep us in line with Amazon's policies. <laughs> They're basically the cops for Amazon for you or the manager. <laughs> They're like a form of cops. They're labor cops. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Labor cops. Shit. Uh, I don't want to watch that show. Labor cops. Uh, <laughs> um, labor cops is filmed on location. Uh, oh, God, no. Well, uh, <laughs> Oh, that makes me. Somebody's gonna do that eventually. It's disgusting. Ah. Um, well, we're we're basically, I guess, out of time, folks. Uh, this this did fly by really quickly. Um, you could have you could absolutely learn more awesome info from Lucky Black Cat on uh, the channel that's in the YouTube description. I'll also paste that into the chat again before we go. Um, you could subscribe to Nora at twitch.tv slash Nora Black Cat. We've got a lot of black cats around the oh, non-compete yeah. <laughs> uh, extended universe. We got. Lucky Black Cat. Lucky and Black got Cat. Nora Black Cat. Nora Black Cat. <laughs> and then we were just helping out Black Cat tutoring with the fundraiser a couple weeks back. So we do welcome our Black Cat family. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for coming and sharing that amazing, really useful information. Uh, Lucky Black Cat. I'm definitely going to be sharing the link to this uh, to this VOD uh, far and wide. If you want to, by the way, see the archive of this, this afternoon I'm going to be uploading a bunch of backlog of streams we've had to uh, the non-compete archive at youtube.com slash non-compete live. And there's also the non-compete highlights channel, which we'll be updating soon as well. Um, but of course you could, yeah, again, go straight to the cat's Someone. mouth <laughs> at Lucky Black Cat's YouTube channel. Uh, do you have any, oh, go ahead, Nora. Yeah, someone had a question. It said, um, oh, Agon said, is unionizing considered a limited legitimate cause for contract termination. Um, so fun story about that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I have been holding, I need to take a piss so badly. I've been holding for long. <laughs> I just, I'll be right back. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. I was just thinking of the Amazon piss in the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. I don't want to get accused. Yeah. Go, please go use the bathroom. Lucky black cat. I don't want to get accused of the same. Of the same um, uh, problem. So, so the funny story about the DSP contract with Amazon, it's actually like a really highly guarded secret. Um, and very few people know what's in the contract between the DSPs and um, um, Amazon. Um, it's very, we, we assume it includes unionization in there. So... Um, you know, it's very strict and like less and less like capitalists are agreeing to um, agreeing to um, go with the contracts because they keep terminating all these country these um, I mean DSPs for getting into lawsuits and they're getting less DSPs willing to take up the contract because it's not worth it. Right. But you see how sophisticated the enemy is. I mean, you see how sophisticated capitalism is and how careful they are to build all these different layers and, and defense works to 
allow them to exploit workers like Nora uh, efficiently and scientifically. It's very disgusting. That's what we're up against, and that's why I think we need to be able to utilize as many tactics as we can, as long as we you know don't utilize them in the same dishonest way. Um, well, welcome back, Lucky Black Cat. Um, do you have any final words of wisdom for folks? Uh, any last thoughts about this subject yeah, or anything else? I'll, I'll just, in case people, I know I introduced my ch channel at the beginning, I'll just say quickly um, that if you want to check out my YouTube channel, I do video essays on a variety of topics, socialism, capitalist realism, systemic racism, debunking right-wing myths. I have a video on labor organizing and its importance for revolution and so on. Uh, my future plans for my channel are to do a video series with the goal of thoroughly exposing how horrible and irredeemable capitalism is. After that, I'd like to do an in-depth series on alternatives to capitalism because we can't just focus on what we're against. We need to articulate what we are for, followed by, followed by a series on revolution and then a series on building revolution. Uh, my general approach to videos is I try to be rigorous in my research. I'd like to try to make my videos fun to watch, you know, add a little bit of comedy. At the same time, I like to give the issues the respect and sincerity they deserve. I don't want to make light of things. I don't want to make jokes at anyone's expense. Uh, you know, I, I, I fucking give a shit about this shit. It's not funny. It's all fucked up. Um, yeah. But I also want people to have fun while they're watching because I know I, I, I have a hard time sometimes finding the, I, as much as I love learning from people's YouTube videos, sometimes I come home and I'm, I'm just fucking exhausted and I don't have the energy to watch things. <laughs> sometimes I just want to like have, you know, and I, I rather watch something just fun sometimes. So I try to make my videos fun too, so that even if you're exhausted, you can enjoy watching it. Uh, once, So my channel's name is Lucky Black Cat. That's Lucky Black Cat, all one word. And the last thing I want to say uh, is not about my channel. I just actually, I want to say, um, well, first of all, I want to say thank you to both of you for, for having me on here. Um, it's been really great to be here. Uh, with both of you, um, and and uh, I really like the show that you are doing because Praxis, uh, you know, actually thinking about how you know, not just theory, but how we're going to put that theory into action is so important because we're never going to move forward without it. So I'm really glad you're doing this show. I'm very honored that you uh, both considered me, you know, an okay person to have on here. <laughs> um, oh, absolutely. And um, and and and. You know, to, to EJ, I want to say, um, I want to thank you for something that you've said before, not which is that like, okay, so like, I feel a lot of anxiety and even sometimes like, I sometimes even verge on despair because I feel like the YouTube channel that I have is, I really want to, you know, I hate how fucked up the world is. I really want to help change it. And I, and I made my YouTube channel to try to do that. And I feel so fucking impotent. I feel so powerless. The impact that I would like to have I, like is the, the the gulf between the impact I would like to have and the impact I actually have is so huge, and I feel so powerless. Um, but something you've said before, EJ, is like that we're in this together. This is a group effort. You know, obviously, you know, with 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 direct action, class struggle, and so on. That's very obvious. That's a group effort. You know, because it, it, you can only create change through a mass movement. But with YouTube, like it's like. Uh, you know, it's such an individual thing. You're working as an individual. Yeah. You you get so focused on your own channel's performance and everything, and it can really fuck with your head. And you can feel so powerless and pathetic, and and unable to do what you've set out to do. And 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 you've said many times before, like this is a group effort. Like all the people, it's obviously a group effort for the whole wider class struggle movement all over the world. But just specifically for YouTube, this is a group effort. Every single person who has a channel that's trying to like push things in a good direction. Don't just think of your own channel. Like anytime I see another video doing well, that's like having a good message that I know is going to push things forward. That's a victory for me too. And I can feel Hell yeah. more empowered. Like I don't have to feel so powerless. Like, like I can feel empowered through the power that others have. And, and, and it's so good to be reminded of that. And you've said that many times and, and thank you for saying that. Cause that is, I still, it hasn't cured my anxiety. I still have extreme <laughs> anxiety every fucking day. I feel like, you know, I am failing to make a difference in the world, but remembering that at least makes me feel a little bit better. So thank you for that. I really, really, really appreciate that so much. Well, I, I have uh, plenty of anxiety every single moment <laughs> of every day. So it's definitely not just you. But yeah, I mean, we're all, we are all in this together and I do think we need to keep building. That's something that uh, Nora is really great at. And that's one of the reasons why I was glad to start the show with Nora was because 
um, nor is a community builder, you know, and oh, um, I'm not great at that, but I do like to surround myself with people who are and try to, uh, you know, work with those people to help, you know, help them do what they do best. So I'm so glad. Like, yeah, like your, your information you presented was is more helpful than you would ever know. Like, um, <laughs> like um, you seriously like solved probably like 12 problems that were on my mind and now I have like a clear path oh. forward. So yeah, that's really, um, it, it's oh, definitely uh, so nice. practical, practical, yeah. like really practical advice. That's exactly why we started the show to try to give people tools to, uh, to build their movements wherever they are. So um, to build our movement, our mass movement. So uh, no, I, I extend to you, uh, Lucky Black Cat, a, an open invitation. If you ever have another like presentation or any other topic you want to come bring on, just let me know and you'll, you're definitely welcome back anytime. Thank you so much. Thank, thank yeah, you thank both you. so much. Thank you. Nora, any, any final words of wisdom before we skedaddle? Um, um... Give someone a small task to do. And, um... <laughs> yes, a call to action. This is our call to action to you. And if you don't have anyone else to give a small task to, give yourself a small task to do. <laughs> As if yeah. you didn't have enough. Yes. I remember recommending like stickering mm -hmm. just around the community. We're taking down stickers. Yeah. Wear gloves if you're going to do that. Um, we're bringing a paint Be scraper. Aware. Yeah, be aware of uh, razor blades if you're taking them down. It's it's like a nice little relaxing walk, and you're putting up yeah. stickers at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Every day, in every way, fight the power. But no, thank you so much, both of you. Um, you know, it's just inspiring to have comrades like Nora and Lucky Black Cat. Um, I'm going to. Uh, we're going to say goodbye to everyone now. I'm going to run the. Thanks for the watching, everyone. Intro. Thank you so much for being here, uh, Lucky Black Cat. Thank you for being here, Nora. Uh, I'm going to run the outro now, and then I'm going to raid into somebody on Twitch. So if you're on Twitch, uh, stay tuned. Uh, otherwise, if you're on YouTube, come on over to Twitch. Have some fun. Try something new for a change. There's your small task. Well, 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 you have now seen and heard me on live stream, so you can put that stamp down on your cringe bingo card. But I think I did okay. I mean, I think it was a good discussion. Uh, there was useful information that was shared and uh, yeah, so we did it. Hooray. Yeah. So anyways, I promised you that the, at the end of this video, I would tell you about what is going on with this channel. So here's the lowdown. As you've probably noticed, I haven't released a new video since December, but I've actually made a few videos since then, and I have the scripts for a few more lined up. So why haven't I uploaded them? Why am I so cruelly depriving you, nay, depriving humanity of this great and glorious gift? Well, my plan is to create eight videos and then release each of them in short succession one after the other, about one week apart each. But why would I do this? Why would I torture you so viciously by making you wait? Well, frequent releases are good for the algorithm, so I'm doing this as an experiment to see if it boosts my channel, which has had, uh, is basically it, it's stagnant in its growth. Now, you may be thinking, but lucky black cat, you shouldn't care about your channel's growth. This is a very superficial concern. Now, I hear you, but here's the thing. <sighs> I really just hate all the horrible things happening in this world, as I'm sure you also do. And I believe in our potential to create a really beautiful world where people's lives can be obviously not perfect, but so much better than they are under capitalism. And uh, I'm, yeah, I'm convinced that our biggest obstacle to creating this type of world is capitalism. And that, you know, we 
need a mass movement to overthrow it. And that an important part of this is to shift people's consciousness. And I would really love more than anything if I could help make this happen. And that's why I started this YouTube channel. Uh, maybe this is delusional of me, maybe maybe it's really egotistical to think that I could even have any sort of impact on this. But hey, you only have one life to live. You might as well try for something really ambitious, you know, and, and if, even if you can't have as big an impact as you hope for, you can at least do something. So I'm trying to do something. And I know the size of your impact. It isn't just measured by the number of views or the number of subscribers. You can't just quantify it like that so simply. But unfortunately, that is an important part of it. Um, so this is why I care about my channel's growth. This is why I'm trying this experiment where I release a bunch of videos in short intervals. Hopefully the algorithm will then just boost me or up. Uh, who knows? We'll see. Uh, so because of this, it may be a couple more months before you see another video from me. But I promise you that I am working very hard to make this happen uh, as fast as I can while still creating, you know, well-researched, entertaining videos that will uh, hopefully be fun and informative for you to watch. I mean, at least, you know, that's the goal. So thank you for your patience. Thank you for your support. And I really can't emphasize this enough, how much I love and appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you also if you've actually gone to the trouble of clicking the bell and turning on all the notifications. Thank you for that too. Thank you for every single comment, every single like, every single time that you've shared one of my videos or told people about my channel. Just thank you for all of these things. And, and even if you haven't done any of these things, just, just thank you for watching. Um, thank you for being here with me on, on this journey and you know, most of all, thank you for everything you do in your life to try to make a better world, you know, ev even if it's in small ways. And I, I know it's hard and I know that we can feel so powerless, but it really does all add up. You know, your actions matter. It all matters. You matter to this world and you matter to me. So thank you. And I wish you all the best.